Okay, we'd like to welcome everyone out to uh, the uh, Planning Commission meeting this evening. We'll start with uh, the pledge and we'll, have, we'll ask uh, Commissioner Ernst to lead us in the pledge. Please rise and state with me the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'm John Mendenhall, the, the Vice Chair of this committee, or this commission. And uh, as you can see, we're short a couple of people tonight. We lost one of our commissioners uh, to the city council La uh, last night. As a matter of fact, he was sworn in as a new city council member. Jesse Carden was our uh, chairman. And before this meeting, we had a work session and we had an election. And our new commission chairman will, will be uh, <laughs> Robert. Uh, Mitchell. Robert here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so uh, with that, uh, he will be the, uh, Todd will be our new uh, chairman of the commission and I'll remain as the, uh, as the vice chair of the commission. So with that, I'm going to turn the rest of the meeting over to Todd and he will conduct it. Great. Thanks, John. Thank you. So... Now we have several things on the agenda. The first one being uh, the minutes. Do you have anybody that can? I move that we accept the minutes from our uh, December 7th, 2022 meeting. Second. A motion and a second. Have a vote. Joseph seconded it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Joseph seconded it. Then you say all in favor. All in favor. Aye. 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 Thank you for the help. Appreciate it. Um, we'll start with our, the next item is a uh, public hearing. We have two public hearings tonight. If there's anybody here to speak for those, we ask you to keep your comments to three minutes as we go through it, or, or the public keep their comments to three minutes. We'll have an uh, introduction from the staff and the applicants if they're here to speak on it. And we'll start with the first one for the uh, 150 South 2022 AT&T cell tower modification. Thank you. Um, the applicants are not here tonight. Um, both of them are relatively similar in nature. Uh, both of them are existing cell towers uh, located within the city. And in both instances, the applicant's looking to swap out and upgrade some equipment at the base and some of the antennas at the top of the tower. The first one we're <coughs> gonna look at is here at 1449 East, 150 South. Um, if we jump to the next slide, please. This is a picture of the existing tower. You can see the Highway 6 um, sound wall is on the left, and then there is a masonry wall behind the residence on the right. Um, and then uh, if we go to the next slide, please. The DRC did look at this in December and provided the following recommendation for you. Um, this is in the staff report as well. Uh, any questions on this first item? Thank you. The applicant is not here. Any comments from the commission? Nope, I'm ready for public hearing when you are. I just have one question. What, why do we have to have a conditional use permit every time the equipment is upgraded and switched out on a cell tower? It's based it's on code. how we currently have it worded as far as uses in the zone that the tower is located in. And so for instance, if it's uh, um, this one's the R18. If you look under the permitted uses and then the conditional uses, it would include the cell tower in that location. And so generally, if it was brand new, there'd be a lot more discussion as far as ways to make it fit into the site or screening or things of that nature. But most of the requests that come before us, they're either increasing the number of antennas or they're increasing the equipment at the base, and so it gives you as the Planning Commission an opportunity to review it and see um, if there's any upgrades that are required as far as potential impacts. Mm. Both of these sites, in my opinion, have relatively small impacts, especially based on, on the requested improvements. So my follow-up question with that is, is there any increased impact to the 
area area with these new no models. in my opinion no okay. <clears throat> thanks great questions is there anybody from the public that would like to address this topic seeing none i'll close public hearing and if there's no more comments from the commissioners i'll look for a motion i just have a comment that shauna made me think of that was I think potentially something I am going to suggest the staff looks into of potentially changing the code that we only vote on it if the staff finds there's an increase of impact uh, versus a non-increase when there's a remodel. Uh, when it's new, I think it's appropriate that it's a CUP for the Planning Commission. That makes sense. But that's an idea I have. I agree. That Shauna made me think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that something we could recommend to the city council? We recommend it to staff and then it comes back before us? Or just? Would it be just to be just a yeah. change in the and, and even if It's something we've discussed a few times with the city attorney, Bob Bell, and it's a little tricky in how do you craft the language in such a manner that, you know, in some cases where we think it's uh, not impactful, our resident or neighbor might. might. It's just we've seen we've seen a number of these. I think we've had one resident ever show up, and I think they were just, they asked a question similar to Sean of what is the improvement to it. And we've and never like, seen oh, a okay. new one. We've never seen a new one, <clears throat> and see, I think it makes sense right. to see a new one. <clears throat> we've been trying to encourage co-location on mm -hmm. existing ones. So mm -hmm. have Smart. We we have had uh, one or two citizens who have come and complained about noise or uh, when the towers were being worked on built uh, because in the <clears> summer <throat> sometimes they were working you know into the dark which was 10 o'clock at night and was bothering the neighbors uh, right next door a yeah a, a little Cleveland yes and uh, I, I think that staff could take care of that very easily however there might be some kind of a legal ramification we can take a look. we'd be happy to just prep a couple of things and maybe take some time in one of your work sessions here. Something. Sounds good. Um, I have some ideas and probably in 10 or 15 minutes we could we could share our I perspective so. and maybe get some additional direction from you. Yeah, I, the only thing that I can I can say there too is is that we need to make sure that uh, we don't run into problems with uh, <coughs> public hearing. You know, because we are looking at uh, a change, so would have to have some language that would that we could run past our legal people. Yep. So. Uh, Planning Commission is the approving body for conditional use permits, correct? Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I can make a motion if you guys want. Great. I, I move the Planning Commission approves the 150 South 2022 AT&T cell tower modification proposal um, contingent upon compliance with staff's findings and conditions. Second. I have a motion and a second. How do I say that? All, All, in, favor. All in favor? Aye. 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 <clears throat> this one is actually a good case in point for exactly what you were just discussing, uh, Commissioner Joseph. Um, the current request is, once again, if we jump to the next slide, this is north of Costco at the North Park. We had a request. Um, So the current request is to make modifications to the antennas as well as the equipment. And then we have a separate carrier who's currently looking at expanding the footprint um, of the enclosure, which would cause some issues with the existing trail and add, add some additional generators and whatnot. And so things of that nature are, are kind of what I think I'm hearing from you as far as crafting the language to trigger a review of those but maybe not necessarily what we're looking at tonight. Is yeah. that fair? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I e even the wording might be substantial increase of yeah. the use. Yeah. Like okay. Or, or, okay. Or, or even moderate. Or impact. Moderate. I think we're packing the footprint. That should definitely come before us. Oh, I okay. so. Which I think we would all agree that's, that meets the standard of moderate. But yeah. Yeah. Okay. You just play with the language, I think. We'll definitely take a stab at that. Um, <clears throat> This one is in a public facility zone, which currently also requires a conditional use, hence the review by the commission tonight. Um, the current proposal would be within improvements within the enclosure, as well as two antennas uh, currently on the co-location tower. 
Any so questions? So, Brandon, this one does not impact adding the generators that you spoke no. about. No. That's a future That's a that separate, will be coming. Separate carrier. Later yeah. on. Separate application. Okay. Yeah. And that one is a little uh, behind in the sense that there needs to be some adjustments to the lease with the city and things of that nature. Okay. This one or the forthcoming the one? The forthcoming oh, one. Okay. Yeah. My comment is I'm grateful for uh, companies that will keep upgrading our cell towers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is also a public hearing, so we'll open it up to public hearing. If there's anybody here to share any comments. Seeing none, I'll close public hearing. Do any of the commissioners have another, any other comments, concerns? I move the Planning Commission approves the 300 East 2022 AT&T cell tower modification as proposed contingent upon compliance with staff's findings and conditions. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 <clears throat> okay, item four. Uh, no, item five. Oh. Preliminary plat, Willowbrook Commercial Subdivision. I'm going to let Mr. Snyder introduce this, but before I do that, I want to express uh, our sorrow at Mr. Rick's passing. A uh, partner that involved in this project uh, died suddenly this past week. Um, again, very sorry to hear that. Um, thank you. We do have uh, the applicant and the applicant's engineer here to address any questions that you might have. This one should look familiar, though. Um, this is a reapproval for a preliminary plat um, located at 1200 North Marketplace Drive, approximately 13, just over 13 acres. If we jump to the next slide, um, actually, let's go back one slide real fast. So if you recall, um, last year, the Planning Commission and City Council looked at some zoning cleanups in the area. This was one of them. Um, the applicant did request at that time to have um, two zones applied to the property in anticipation of the proposed development that we have a concept um, attached for you to look at as well. But tonight, we're just looking at the preliminary plat, which is basically the preparation of it for subdividing. Um, so we have the I-1 zone to the rear and the business park in the front. We can jump to the next slide. Relatively straightforward. There'd be a lot here adjacent to Marketplace Drive, shared access that would um, provide entry to the rear, a uh, larger portion of the property. Um, some of the property is encumbered with some wetlands, which will um, be enhanced. Let's go to the next slide. This is a concept that was provided by the applicant, which we appreciate. Um, it's working its way through with the final plot as well as the site plan. Um, potentially have an office warehouse uh, constructed here and you'd have more of an office or professional services building on the front. It's a unique property line, huh, Brandon? Very unique. Yeah. And there's a good story to why it's um, in that configuration. We'll let the applicant share that with you. So if we jump back a slide, um, this is your main focus tonight is the approval of the lot layout for the preliminary plot. Any questions for what, staff? What do we have there? The the dotted e is an easement. These are what do we easements. Have there? Yep. I can't read that though. What is Utility that? Utility easement of sorts. Utility easement, and I'm not sure what this one is. It's the wetland delineation That's potentially. Yeah. That the Probably. delineation. Probably. Wetland delineation. <coughs> Remind me, there's only one entrance to the entire project. That is that correct? Yeah. If we okay. go to the next slide, Mike. Is there a shared access here for both lots? There will be on the plat. Yes. Okay. Cross access easement, yeah, shared access, probably more appropriate name. Yeah, so they would both, uh, Lowe's has their entrance into the rear yard here. The expressway business park is to the south. This would be the only entrance in and out of the property. Is this more of an office and this is a kind of office warehouse? Yes. And this is Lowe's? Yep. And so there will be some sort of a fence or barrier, then there won't be any any uh, cross connection between the two. I think it's more of the grade, tra grade change, excuse me, as to why there's no cross access between the two. And so you're, you're planning on leaving, they're planning on leaving that higher and not, okay. Yep. That's and and this, this matches more of the 
business park over here. The industrial. It, the industrial, yeah. yeah. Yep. What's the road width here? 40? Uh, great question. Do you know off the top of your head? I think there's a dimension you'd have to zoom in. Yeah. 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 Was the city nice to you guys? Because there's going to be semi trucks, and I know the city sometimes <laughs> is not that nice. Asphalt, but it's, it's 43 curb to curb, yeah. Okay. Oh. Thanks, Mike. That should work for semi trucks. Okay. Any questions for staff before we turn some time over to the applicant? Why are we, re remind us why we're reapproving? So our preliminary plats have an expiration date assigned to them. Um, trying to blank two years. So. so when it's approved, you have two years and within that two years, you need to have the final plat recorded. If you break it into phases, then each time you record a final plat, it further extends that preliminary plats approval. But if they expire, then it's just a simple matter of coming back through for reapproval to start the project again. So th is this trail that goes along here? That is a trail, good, good eye. So that will connect to the trail system over here, mm -hmm. and then it'll connect um, to the city owned property here, and the city has future plans to carry it out to Spanish Fork Parkway. Okay. But there are no plans at this time to do anything with those wetlands to mitigate them and try to uh, develop those just leave them there you, you made a comment about enhancing the wetlands what, what was meant by that protect and preserve just protecting okay yeah. is there a masonry wall of some sort right here or a fence or what are they doing here uh, along no. this trail um, that's a detail I don't recall from the site plan what's the zone I don't what's believe the, we have any fencing is, is it the same zone here as here same zoning um, or the is it back two uses? thirds is the same as is that yeah. And then this is the business park. Yep, there you go. Do we ever require lighting along the trail? In rare instances, have we had lighting? I don't think we've ever required it. Uh, it's typically the trails along frontage of roads where there's lighting anyway. We try to do that for sure. Um, it's conceivable that the city might at some point in time add lighting if we felt like there was a I was asking just because I was imagining a trail next to a six-foot masonry wall and it not it kind of being pretty uh, isolated is what I was imagining. And then no lights as well. And anyway. This is have the parking lot lights on one side and then maybe back a house on the south if side. If there's parking lot lights, that would help quite a bit. And then I was thinking of if there's a different, if it, if it abuts some other zone, then potentially they'd have to do a masonry wall anyway. And I just think it down, down the line. You'll definitely line. have parking lights. Yeah, there will yeah be. parking lights here, and you'll probably have some flood and lights help. in the back. Parking lots here. That'll help, too. Okay. Great observations and questions. That's what we're here for. We're from Apple. Thank you. We're right on it. Does the applicant want to come up and make any comments? If you'll please. zoning was changed our mapping folks I wouldn't say they were arbitrary but the dividing line between the business park zone and the light industrial zone was uh, was maybe done a little bit sloppily so the idea that we might go back and adjust that to fit in with what the real intent was which is the plan that you were looking at where does it fall now does it fall you like know, more back right yeah. um, I back will say here. As the city's zoning administrator, that Mr. Sheesh is the applicant, doesn't need to worry about that mapping issue impacting their plan to be able to move forward with this, as is shown on this image at all. Okay. I'm, I'm comfortable. Dave, that's a good answer. And I'm, yeah, glad I'm, I'm actually relieved that that is the answer. That yeah. is, that's a great answer. Just for the record, we did work through this. Yeah, I don't after know the meeting and I'm surprised that that map is that zoning map is still there because it was resolved to be congruent with this because when we came to Planning Commission previously it was this that was shown we went to City Council it was this that was shown and approved and then later when I came in to start the work which is one of the reasons things got slowed down among other things 
we had to have discussions to pull up the recordings of this meeting and the other meeting to show this is what was approved in that, that zoning map. Whoever did the mapping pushed it too far. We just agreed in here that it was corrected. No but one's disputing that map. No, like this. No. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I just want yeah, for the record as as having learned from my past experience. Yeah. If you could please state your name. So David Sheese. Okay. And then if you have anything else to share, we'd love no. to hear about the no. project. We'd love to hear like about to hear, the wonky. Yeah, the jigsaw piece down here. I'd love to get the story oh. behind that. This is, I explained this two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, when we bought this property almost 30 years ago, um, oh. we knew that there was landfill on the north and the south. Mm -hmm. And we didn't want to have any landfill. So um, we had LEI 30 years ago do some very deep pothole testing and determined a, what we call a trash delineation map. Yeah. And that little jog there had trash in it. Two owners prior to the people that have it now wanted some trash stuff that, and we didn't want it. So that's how the line was drawn. So we could say that we didn't have any trash on our property. That's great. So the current owners want, would like to, you know, just maybe make that all straight. But I don't think we need to, we're just gonna keep it because it's in the wetlands and we're all sharing the wetland, um, keeping it nice. So what happens with this little job that is currently your property here? That's, uh, yeah. That's connected, it looks like, yeah. to this little neck. So that's kind of a gob hanging out there for yeah, the next that's person. That's kind of a funny south. piece, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. But it's just still part of your wetlands area ish. The wetlands is a dotted area. Oh. Um, I don't know. I haven't thought about that. Do you want it? Okay. I'll give it to you. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't make any difference to me. <laughs> just a weird, a, weird, uh, a weird spot there where you have part that isn't and part that is. And yeah. I know. You could build that that map's been that way for 25 years. Right. Yeah. And neither are in the wetlands, so. No. And doesn't have trash in it either. So that's how we, I don't know why, I can't remember. Some guy that built that mobile home park on the south that, that they tore down. Yeah. He, yeah. That's the way he wanted it, so we just did it. Fine. I can't remember that. I'm getting old. <laughs> that's all. This, this is questions? the same map that you approved two years yeah. ago. Great. Has it really been two years? <laughs> Thank you. Any other comments from the commission? Nope. We have a motion. Do we make? Yes, but I don't want to hog all the motions. <laughs> it's so nice of you. Try uh, share. I'll, I'll make the motion. I move uh, that the proposed preliminary plat be approved based on the findings and subject to the conditions that are listed here on our proposal. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor. All in favor. Aye. 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 Todd, did you It's gonna take a while to get used. You'll get it. <laughs> did you vote on that? I did, I said I. Oh, okay, fine. I didn't hear you, I was just curious. I giggled through it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> We're down to title 50. Yeah, I'm wondering, do we? Sometimes I wonder about the order we put these in, mm -hmm. like making people wait while we go through it. You can actually switch that up. You could things. do the best of concept now. Yeah. If it makes sense to me. What you're saying makes sense to me. Maybe when Dave's done with this side conversation, we can talk about that. They're not here? We were wondering about switching that if they Land, were here. The landscape uh, professionals are here. If the, but the landscape professionals are here waiting also. No, this is this is the main event. Oh, okay. is it? Who, who are, yes. Who are you guys talking about? The landscape professionals, of course. <laughs> Whatever. We can we can continue with the. The botanists are here. The landscape. Botanists. Title 15 okay, amendment. They refer to themselves as that. <laughs> landscape um, architects. Yeah, um, that's. Absolutely, you, it. that's why we hired them. You hit that on the nose. And, <laughs> um, I don't have a lot really to say about this, but do want to express 
my gratitude to Mark and Aubrey for helping us over the course of the past six months or so to develop what we'll talk more about tonight. From a conceptual standpoint, it's right in line with what was reviewed during your joint meeting with the city council here a few months ago. <coughs> It's been refined, um, might be a couple of additional tweaks we want to make over the course of the next few weeks, but I would really just call those kind of clerical, some things maybe to make it a little bit easier for us to administer the, uh, the proposed standards. Um, I'm going to reiterate a couple of things just off the top of my head that I included in the staff report before I turn things over to... I'm not sure if it's Mark or Aubrey that's going to be taking the lead, whoever that is, or both. Um, uh, the impetus for this came from uh, a few different sources that all just kind of coalesced over the same several months here. Earlier in 2022, um, the situation with the water supply throughout the western United States, that didn't just come about you know, this past year, but... Certainly, to some degree, the, the dialogue about drought conditions and, and the dire need for everybody to be more responsible in terms of how water is used. I think that's kind of hit a crescendo for sure. Um, and uh, I think at least partly because of that, we started to get pushback from businesses that felt like uh, it was not appropriate for them to follow our existing current landscape requirements that, I mean, for example, they require a certain part of sites of all different types to uh, have turf grass and have, uh, <clears throat> certain other types of vegetation and that sort of a thing, um, which led to some other conversations about, well, if we, if we do let up on our requirements, then what does that mean for the future of the city? What does that look like? Uh, what kind of a community does that lead to us having here? And as part of kind of this bigger conversation as well, there are some outside agencies also that um, started to provide some, some recommendations to cities like Spanish Fork about uh, what we should require from a landscaping perspective, what we should allow. And it just really put us at a point of staff where we felt like we needed to review what we had in terms of landscape requirements and potentially you know, bring what now we are tonight, you know, forward to you and then, then to the city council to consider by way of changes to our landscape requirements. And that's where we are. Um, I like to keep things as simple as I can. So this is how I'm going to describe um, what this would accomplish. Um, and we kind of touched on this just briefly um, in your work meeting before we stepped in into the council chambers tonight. But um, for property owners with single family homes on individual lots, this would not change what you can do with your property from a landscape perspective, which is a little bit of a different approach from what some other agencies have suggested that we should do. Um, and that's been the topic of discussion that to some extent that we've had with you and with the city council and I think providing options for our residents in terms of what they do with their lots is really important. Um, that could change, and the belief that it's really important, that, that's just my opinion. But um, So no change for, again, single-family homes on individual lots. Um, and what that no change means is that there is a wide variety of what people can do. You could do true xeriscape. Our ordinance allows for that. Um, you can do turf grass. You could do... You know, any, any other types of vegetation that you want to do, maybe just with a few limitations on certain types of trees that you can or can't plant in certain areas, depending on whether they're power lines or a need for visibility or that type of a thing. But very permissive for that situation. And again, I'll, I'll reiterate, uh, no proposed change to that. For How, single, single, for single family. family homes. Exactly. Now... The situation is very different as proposed with other types of development. So any kind of multifamily development, it could be a six unit townhome project and they would have to follow a program that's very different 
from what is in place today. Uh, it's a much more sophisticated approach by way of what's proposed, and I'll let, again, Mark or Aubrey maybe talk through what that means. Um, it could be a 200 home apartment project and the approach to how space in, in that development is landscaped, very different. Um, Water-wise, landscape requirements do come into play and uh, um, what we might have seen traditionally in Spanish Fork by way of just having uh, every inch of, of uh, green space on a site developed with Kentucky bluegrass won't happen. That, that, is, that is not in the cards with what's proposed tonight. Same would be said for any kind of retail office, industrial project, same approach would be taken to where water-wise uh, landscaping would be required. Uh, the process that somebody would go through to have a landscaping plan approved and to have a site uh, developed in accordance with that plan and that type of a thing. Uh, again, it's, it's a different level of sophistication that we're talking about tonight from what the city has employed in the past. And I think it's by all means time for Spanish Fork to be what I think really would be something of a leader in that regard. And I think both Mark and Aubrey are more familiar with, with how some other cities might approach things than I am even, but I'm not aware of other communities that have gone to this degree yet with what is being proposed tonight. And feel free if, I'm, if you want to correct me on anything like that. I certainly welcome that, but uh, we're trying to be maybe ahead of the curve a little bit and proactive and in my view, more than anything, just sensible and to do the right thing. Um, so that's my intro. If you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them, but. Just a couple of clarifications. Yeah. Yeah. So this Spanish work doesn't need to be doing this, right? Our water usage is, our water supply is enough for our water usage now and into the future. I believe that's true, yes. We're, we're doing this more as a, a conservation for everybody. I mean, just being smart with our water usage, not wasting it, and also, you know, for the surrounding communities, right? I'd elaborate on that to say, I mean, it's really an effort to be good citizens of a bigger community, a yes. Bigger community. Um, yes. Spanish Fork is unique and fortunate because of decisions that were made decades ago mm -hmm. to secure a water supply that uh, by its scale is different from what other communities have access to. But yet um, we don't want to, to uh, use such a vital resource um, inappropriately. Sure. Does, does, do you or staff feel like any of the recommendations or requirements that are in the proposal, are they going to uh, change a standard that we've grown to expect here and, and like it's going to impact citizens that might be viewed negatively? You know, we've made an effort to avoid that. Mm -hmm. And for me, that really comes with, in our office in particular, you know, look at it just maybe from the selfish perspective, I don't want to tell, for example, you know, a new homeowner, not that lot size matters, but I'll pick a lot size just to make my point, you know, that uh, has bought a third of an acre lot in an area of the community where over the past several years we made an effort to have developers build big lots to tell them that when they build their dream home there, they can't landscape their backyard with turf grass mm -hmm. if they want to. Um, we've tried to be really sensitive to the, the broad range of desires that property owners in Spanish Fork might have about how they want to have their properties developed, um, understanding that most of the lawn space in Spanish Fork today is, is turf grass and I think allowing people in the future to enjoy some of the same benefits that people have in the past uh, have enjoyed. I think that's important. So uh, again, we've tried to be really sensitive to not create any adverse impact on existing residents in the community or even future residents that might want to be doing um, what's been done in the past. Right. Now, when it comes to other types of development, I don't think that installing landscaping that meets the proposed requirements is going to be cheaper than what somebody could install the day. 
I think somebody's going to have to pay more attention when they design their landscaping. Um, and uh, um, they might have to invest more than what are, are currently in place requirements would require. Um, but part of the train of thought is that it's worth it. Mm -hmm. That conserving water and having sites developed in such a way that even though less water is needed, they stay beautiful. Right. And it, it adds something to the community and doesn't become a detraction. That's really what this is about. Is in many of the slot. Is it Xeroscape for retail and office? And mm. is that where we're at? Or um, is it some combination of the two? Boy, I don't want to get too hung up on semantics. Uh, but I'll use, <laughs> this is a good time maybe to talk about this. Xeroscape, all rock. Let's say, I mean, that's one way to define no, zero scale. No living plants. This does not allow for that. This does not allow for that under any circumstance. Xeriscape, which is different, zero. which is maybe a combination of rock mulch and plants and different things like that. Yeah. That's absolutely what this promotes. Um, and I would say that's, that's kind of the water-wise concept that as a, you know, interchange Xeriscape phraseology. has an X at the beginning. Zero has a Z. Yes, yep. I, I, and you I can because I've I've worked with cities uh, in Utah and other states where they have explained to me that they used to require zero scape, Got it. and they found it to be ugly, and they transitioned out away from that, and and that was a surprise to me. It was I was that was interesting, and I would say you know um, to some degree, we've even transitioned in the past from that to where. We had some projects. Um, there's a fueling station, for example, on Main Street, 1600, mm. 1500 North, give or take. It's all rock, all the way around it. Uh, this was just <clears throat> seven or eight years ago. Um, and after, well, maybe a little bit more than that, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But after that was built and a few other sites were, to, were uh, improved in a similar fashion with all rock, that's the origin for, or was the impetus for us amending your landscape requirements at that point in time to say, of your required landscaping, you have to have a certain part of that in turf grass, just as some way to try to keep That is what things. this particular, a particular city I'm thinking of, that's what they did. Okay. Because they, they needed the, dif the differentiation and they, it, it, it improved it. Quite yeah. Well. So I mean, that's maybe also a good illustration of how these things do tend to evolve over time. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised at all if over the course of the next couple of years we come back and say, hey, you know. Tweak it a little more. Yeah. Um, but uh, I'm really, really happy with where this is at. Uh, the approach, in my opinion, is unique. But uh, from the first time that Mr. Vlasic described it to me, uh, by way of starting first with how much water should be used to keep a particular property beautiful, and allocating that water through a certain design process to make sure that you're getting the best bang for your buck in terms of ground cover and and that type of a thing. Um, it just resonated with me that you know, it, it's a good approach. Um, and I say that kind of sight unseen. We haven't worked with it yet, so something of a leap of faith on our part of staff. But um, They look trustworthy. Right. <laughs> Dave, yeah. on the, uh, so that's on commercial, what about uh, multifamily developments. We often spend a lot of time with the amenities, making sure they have playground spaces, grass fields for children to play in. Um, this still allows for, yeah, dog parks. This still allows for that, but other incentives for doing some zero escape in other sections of the development? Or does it, or does it curtail or that? Water, or water-wise landscaping. That's a good one for you guys to help keep me in check on I'll throw this out there it's, it's a matter of of priorities and trade-offs and a balance I believe that we specifically allowed why you, why you come up with perfect time come on perfect yeah. time <laughs> and, and it, COVID if I recall uh, allows for parks and those sorts of facilities to have turf so that that, that they the sort of trade-off is that you're going to need those spaces because you have maybe a little bit less lawn at some of these multifamily I really appreciate the, the design and the pictures and the 
mm -hmm. diagrams and all of that that's right. part of this. Okay, I have a couple of questions. Sure. One, I think co goes with Dave. Dave, you said if you have a single family home, new here in our, or existing, that you can choose how you do it. But I have on page nine, letter E, landscape requirements for all project types. That, is it project that is the differentiation? Is that excluding single family homes? Mm -hmm. Because to me, all project types means single family homes as well. Am I wrong on that? Well, you may have some of these these requirements on park strips and things like that that so are your development uh, features that uh, aren't single family. I'm just I, you're, I'm you're, just on page nine and looking at E, and I'm like, well, is this telling me that I, there are certain trees that I can't put in my yard? Uh, it's, the I section E is particularly feet. meant for all project types. So you're correct. That's for single. So we start off that these are what uh, this was what applies to single family type developments. More this is for that. all other types of developments, yeah, and right section here. E is then for all of them. These will apply to all of them. So this is saying that. You cannot zero, further down it says you can't zero scape. It also has, there's certain trees I can't put in my yard. There's, I mean, that's fine. I, and there must be a reason that those certain trees shouldn't be in my yard. But if you go down farther. Lawn should not be installed in park strips, it says. Right. And then here we have pro prohibited tree list. You know, some of these other, no zero scape, zero scape not permitted. That means all. That so that goes against, yeah, so that goes against what you just right. said. Now, Brandon and I kind of had a heart-to-heart -heart about that yesterday. Let me take these one by one. Okay. Otherwise, I will get totally lost. Let me hold the zero escape for right. just a second. And, and my main question is, is it really has to do with E, all yeah. project types. Let's read through that just a little bit more carefully on, we can just go back up to where we started there with, yeah. So for single family, where it's referenced with single family, and I haven't read through this for a few days, but it's F. Go to F. So where, for example, we say at maturity, single family landscapes are recommended. So okay. we are using that kind of language when we talk about single family homes. We are promoting the idea that it's best um, in that environment if people follow the kinds of provisions that we're talking about here. We're not saying thou shalt or thou must or that you can't do certain other things with the exception of when we get down to the zero scape. Right, okay. Which there's language in our ordinance today and Brandon helped me look at it just yesterday in such a way to see that today we let people there are kind of three key things. People can satisfy the city's landscaping requirement for their single family lots with turf grass, with shrubbery, and with zero scape. But zero scape with zero an Zero scape with yeah. all rock. Mm -hmm. We could certainly take the position that that hasn't been permitted in Spanish Fork for quite some time. So if that is, if somebody does that, then does somebody knock on their door or did they get a letter from the city saying you this is against ordinance we haven't done that but that certainly could happen that would not meet the city's requirements it would violate the zoning mm -hmm. ordinance and you could take some kind of code enforcement action in that okay case. then so to me though it, i mean there is the thing in there single family landscapes recommended but honestly, it seems like if you just start at E, at the beginning of E, saying landscape requirements for all project types except single family homes, because that's what the intent is. Is that correct? I think it's at just some be point more clear. We said something to that, that, that degree. We did make an effort while this was being refined to distinguish between what was not just encouraged and what is required. And we could certainly beef that up. That is the intent. Anyway. I think the language in D leaves me, I would like it to be clear that single family homes are not. And maybe it's better for us just to completely segregate the language. Yeah. Where yes. We've got single family and we've got multifamily. 
that would not be hard for us to do. And you can even put single family, you can, but it's recommended. There's something that came across, and you guys probably are addressing all this, but I was thinking, well, you know, does every new home, every new single family home receive a flyer saying, these are our recommendations for Spanish Fork. I'm wondering, do you send out a flyer to all our residents with single family homes saying, thank you for keeping your, you know, this is, this is what is required in Spanish Fort. Like you have to have your yard not be unsightly or whatever to remind uh, us as homeowners that what is expected in the code. But then here's some great recommendations if you're thinking about what you can do to be a good water citizen. That's an education system, I think, and there's been several places that have done that. Central Utah Water Conservancy District has pushed this kind of a program for a long time and have made their facilities and their people uh, available to, you know, uh, have different programs where they, where they make people aware of the types of uh, plants and the type of landscaping that can be done at their old facility, they had a garden that had all of them there, and there's other places that can do that. One thing I wanted to mention is that someone said something about uh, lawn should not be installed in park strips. This actually says paths or slopes greater than 25% or four to one grade. Right. So that's not, so lawn can still be in the park strip. Right. It's just if it's in a place where the, where the uh, where the slope is greater than 25% or 4 to 1, mm -hmm. it's discouraged. Perfect. Should not. I think it says not. It says should not, not be. It doesn't say you can't. Pass. It says should not be. It says not in the park strips. So it's. Should not be installed in park strips. But, but you know, it, the, the point is this of that. It's, and the word should is really different than shall. That's right. Really different. So that's. And if you just look, for example, at the difference between D and E. Um, and this is where I think to your point, Shauna. Have you ever listened like, to Joseph argue the shall and the shoulds and the recommended and the hey, required? I would bet he, 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 he can do a it. large Coke Zero <laughs> with anybody that he and I see it the same way. Should and shall, right? They mean very different things. Yeah, yes. they do. We know that. But I, I, I think I completely agree that we can make this more clear and simple. And honestly, how many new residents are going to go through and read this code? Not a lot, but if you have a, a, a general style guide that's easily read and you know interpreted by so simplified, we have, we have prepared that. that's awesome. That's we so to, we have the ordinances, but in addition to the ordinances, we prepared a design guideline for specifically for single family. Awesome. That's our showpiece. Perfect. Yeah. That's the. That's <laughs> awesome. That is so awesome. I'm so smart, and I'm not a landscape architect. But also on page um, 29 of the document, we also need our letter translated to English. Okay. From Mayor Mendenhall. <laughs> what, what, which language is it? Oh, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's, 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 I don't know what Our placeholder <laughs> I know, letter. I know. Got it. I just had that's a smile funny. on it. Yeah. Okay. But, but also, uh, if we're talking about uh, new construction, and that's where the majority of this will be enforced mm -hmm. or encouraged, then the place that this should be is with the building permit. You know, this, uh, you know, when you uh, come and get the building permit, there are things in there already about landscaping and the, the city actually charges some money that get, you get back if you finish your landscaping and those things, and it's already there. So this can be put together with that uh, and should be part of that. I'm I sure it'll be. A, it's planned on being. I'm sure it'll be right? a condition uh, of passing these requirements for CFO. Exactly. Yeah. It'll just be they need to comply with yes. these stated guidelines, and then they'll have to find out what that is and comply with it in their design. Yeah. Yes. And for us, and I'll, I'll again, kind of the showpiece for us are the guidelines for residential development. That it's a it's a separate document. I don't want to steal totally these folks' thunder by getting into it too much ahead of the the game for tonight but um, that is the PR component to this effort changing our requirements to get them to where they make sense for 2023 in our current situation we have to have that foundation in place 
for code enforcement specifically. For code enforcement and you know just to, to get the actual improvements aligned with what what's appropriate. But in those situations where, like we talked about with, with single family homes, uh, encouraging people to, um, in the right ways, use a more water wise landscaping approach. I think this is something of a consistent blitz then that the city does through all different types of means and channels, including, you know, as people are maybe moving into their homes before they install their landscaping and that type of a thing to say, hey, yeah, you can still hydro seed and have Kentucky bluegrass or you can bring in sod, but there's this other approach that you could take as well. And if you do it this way, this is what it could look like. And, you know, that type of a thing, just to try to really, really promote the idea that there are other ways to make your lawns beautiful or your properties beautiful and to make them usable still and that type of a thing. Um, much of what we do in our office is completely reactive. True. People submit an application and we respond to that. Either it meets our requirements and it moves forward or it doesn't, it likely doesn't move forward. Um, I think part of having this be successful is us and other, other departments in the city get more proactive and you know, kind of share that, that positive mes message about what you can do. So, and honestly, you know, as a homeowner with an established yard, getting something in the in the mail or however I receive it, it will at least put something in my mind so that I can consider: is there something that I can do? It, is it how difficult is it for me to do? But giving me the ideas. Dave, help me remember, but uh, it seems like Central Utah Water Conservancy District had a program for a while. They would send someone out to your yard and do a water, uh, what did they call it, a, a water audit. Oh, and they yeah. would, you know, if you've got a sprinkler system, they would turn it on and see what the coverage is and put out some cans, that whole idea. And I don't know how, I don't know how effective that was, but I do know that Spanish Fork City went through a process of installing new uh, sprinkler system controllers yeah. at no cost and partnered with CUP and that that hey I have one in my garage and on my program. system and I love it and everybody I talk to that knows how to use them loves them and it was a great success and I think that that uh, it took a couple of years to get those all installed but I would imagine that as Utah's uh, conditions continue <laughs> this year or accepted maybe but, you know, I would imagine that you'll see more of that where the deep pockets of CUP might be able to help with some of these things. And I know that there ought to be, if not, there should be grant money through different agencies, including the state's budget. The governor's just proposed over $200 million towards uh, water conservation. But he's also put a big tag on that to go to uh, the Great Salt Lake. Uh, but that doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking tonight. But, you know, if with some education, I think that that's what we're talking about here is that I certainly don't know everything about Xeriscape or uh, the best way to do this. I do know that whatever you put in takes maintenance, even rock. You know, I've got some rock areas on my yard and I put down the, uh, the material underneath it to keep the weeds from growing up through it. You have to feed them too. Have you been feeding them? Yes, you oh, have okay. to feed them. Yeah, as long as you've you been gotta, feeding them, you gotta feed them, and then and then eventually they silt in and and and, they, and weeds grow up through them anyway. In other words, there's nothing that is uh, labor free. Once you put it in, you've still got to maintain it to keep it looking good, and so uh, you know there's not an end to it. It's an ongoing thing. <clears throat> but I'd, I'd like to see their presentation. It might it might uh, you know, answer a lot of our questions. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Audrey, I think you'll, uh, it sounds like not everybody has seen the, so I think that we'll pull it I've up. seen it. I did the reading. We got that last. We'll talk, we'll I did the reading. We were just going to do a summary. So, well, thanks. I, if we could go back to the PowerPoint. I had the presentation that was up there. Uh, do you want, or P, is it a PDF? Sorry. Presentation. 
So this is a, a summary of what's contained in this, these changes. It's primarily the ordinance changes, as was discussed, but we do have this uh, uh, design guideline document that was we put quite a bit of effort in, and we'll talk a little bit. I'll actually walk you through it this evening so that you can see what's contained in it. Uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, so just sort of give you an understanding of what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to just talk about what the... And, I, and Dave talked about it quite a bit about why we did this, so we maybe can brush over that. But then we're going to talk about the landscape regulations, so the ordinances. We're updating also your she, uh, street and shade tree lists so that it's more extensive and gives a lot more information to the public, sort of in that idea of educating as well, that uh, when you choose a tree, it's an important decision, and there's more to it than just the size or the color. And then at the end, we can uh, have some more discussion. So um, again, you know, did, again, Dave really went through quite well that we do have drought. We know that you have significant water resources, which put you in this unique setting. And but um, this is uh, really to uh, allow for change to happen over the next few years in response to the, uh, the drought situation. The concern of the city obviously was that it's, you don't get this ugly look. And it's you know, the, zero, the zero scape sort of embodies that. And I think it was interesting what you said because that's what we're finding as well, is communities that have gone to a zero scape have, are turning away from it because people just say it, it is not what they expected in their community. And um, so we're trying to encourage change for the single family and the rest of it will be requiring it through ordinances. If we go to the next um, main new components is this new and updated landscape ordinance or landscape requirements that are part of your municipal code and updated street and shade tree list included with that and then this new residential guidebook. So it's sort of three, three prong changes and we'll walk through each of those now. Um, so we do have these different processes requirements for single family as we've been talking about a lot here tonight uh, that are quite similar to what you had before that you can do more or less what you know you can follow the city's ordinances or you can do pretty much what you want with your yard we're not trying to dictate as uh, really at all or as much as we would with the other types of multifamily and non-residential uses for those types of uses the ordinance is a lot different than what you had before it uh, for example requires that a professional uh, landscape architect and or irrigation designer uh, be involved in the project that we establish for each project your water budget and that water budget is based on the amount of water that tr traditionally falls in this area so that it's based actually on agricultural practices so it's how farmers know how to um, f flood irrigate their fields and when to do it and and then a scheduling process of how you're going to then get water onto your landscape if it's a large landscape, how you're going to do it over a week period so that there's no waste during that time. So because it's, it requires a, a knowledge that the idea that landscape architects and irrigation designers are the appropriate people to be involved in the, the project, which also is going to help you guarantee that the look is what you're anticipating because they're, that's what they do for a living. They, they design these sorts of landscapes. So. Are most landscape architects also qualified to provide the irrigation design? I'd say most are. Okay. Um, and uh, we can give an example of our office. We have a couple of people that that's pretty much what they, all that they do. But when we work on large projects, we'll bring a certified irrigation designer in it to, to manage it because they take it to the next level. So. Um, but that, if you're a licensed landscape arch architect in Utah, you're licensed to be doing uh, professional irrigation designs. Thank you. So, wait, clarification on, so that's for non-residential multifamily developments. 
where what's the bottom end of that multifamily development? Are we talking a fourplex? Yes. So a threeplex. Three Anything that's multifamily would have to I have. Think we actually exclude twin homes. A twin, a three, yeah. A twin home, like a single, single family twin homes so are the same. Above that, they're going to have to have a landscape mm -hmm. architect, a irrigation consultant, right, person to tell them their what their water usage. Is yeah, and it's they use a, a the, when they hire a landscape architect, they'll know how to go about finding these resources. They're easily available on websites, and so it's it's nothing that uh, they can have to do significant research each time. We have actually put into the ordinance your number to use, and there's some formulas to use in this. The, so the number for your for Spanish Fork is different than it is for say Salt Lake City. Sure. And so they're not going to have to go research those things. If we're making it as cookie cutter in that sense as possible, so that they all they have to do is calculate based on the the amount of open land on their project, and they have to do some calculations. Okay. And we do have the resource of several irrigation uh, uh, sprinkler companies mm -hmm. within just a few miles of Spanish Fork can design the system if you'll take them your plot plan that has all of your design, they will do that for you as part of the project if you buy your material from them. Right, from Hunter or from Rainbird or uh, any of those. Right. right. So what, what we're thinking you're going to end up with is a more, over time, a more consistent look to your city. I think that's something that we're looking at. We're really focusing on having good treescape as well. The, the urban forest is something that can help uh, assuming that things, you know, are going to get drier in the future, that the idea of introducing good shade to the city is something that's very important. You already have that tradition here, so we're really beefing up that component of it. Uh, it doesn't take, once trees and shrubs are established, they use a lot less water than, say, uh, obviously a turf grass, but even other types of plant materials. And so we're, you know, we're, we're allowing a wide range of plant types, including turf grass. I mean, it's not to say that you can't have any turf grass on any of these properties. Um, they will, if they use it, they just have to know that they're going to have to use other parts of the site for things that are more water-wise. So what you end up with is more logical type of layouts of your, your landscape. And so it's not, if you have skinny strip of lawn, that probably doesn't make a lot of sense because it's hard to maintain, as you were mentioned, as well as to irrigate it. You, end up over spraying and losing water that way. And these are, all, again, all things that a, a professional would know through their training. If we go to the next slide. So uh, this is how the, uh, you, you've seen this, how the ordinance is laid out into these six chapters or sub-chapters. We start with defining what the purpose of why we're doing this. We then talk about the specific requirements for single family and twin home uses then for all of the other types of projects, which would be um, re uh, sub residential subdivisions over, as was mentioned, over three units, professional office, public, commercial, and industrial uses. And there are some disclaimers, as I mentioned, in there for things like parks and for golf courses, those sorts of things where you will have turf is a big part of it and it is necessary to have a good, good functioning city and having those kinds of spaces. Then the requirements for all project types. And then we have the details of what the process is for how it, these are implemented and how the city regulates them in Chapter E. And then we have very significant resources here, which are linked then to this document that we've prepared for public education. Um, next slide. Qu quick question. Dave, the MPD status would still allow us to provide variances within this, or no? I don't believe that's the intent at all. So for a... Like if there's, uh, if the park carve-out is insufficient, or the, the one of the amenities is propo proposed is a soccer field, and city council thinks that's a great idea, but it, it doesn't work in this new code, would an MPD solve that? Hmm. See, I would, um, and when this came up earlier tonight, I thought that that might make some sense for us to look at from the perspective of, because these regulations, 
least potentially don't apply. And Mark touched on it, things like cemeteries, you know, city parks, golf courses, obvious reasons, right? Um, it might make sense to explicitly write into the standards that there can be some exceptions for like facilities, whether they're publicly or privately owned. So that if somebody did do Could maybe be seven of the ordinance, I think we already have it in there. Do we have it of the the exemptions list? Okay. And that's private or public? Okay. Good. There we have it. So is that what you're talking about? Is if somebody did want to do like a soccer field that you said? Yeah, and the and we, we, we and have planning commission, city council thought, and staff thought it was a great idea. And so uh, conceivably that would Yeah, I, I would think that they would delete that from the, the yeah. overall project. Yeah. And it says this is, this is excluded because it's a park that's necessary and parks. And within that park, you would hopefully get a professional designer who's going to put a part of it that's going to be water-wise anyway. Yeah. Uh, everything fact, except the play fields. I haven't seen a project of any notable size that doesn't have a landscape architect involved. Right, yeah, I don't think you can design them and build them I without a... Uh, agreed. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's see, we're kind of between pages here. So the, you know, the, the purpose, we just discuss again, as I mentioned, what, um, what, the, what, what we're trying to achieve with this. The key items with single family twin homes is that it's it, this is different than your other code. It kind of linked them all together, and we just pulled it out and said that it's different than the rest of the areas in, that's covered under the code, and that water conserving designs are encouraged, but they're not required, and that um, that we would encourage this local scapes five steps process, which uh, Aubrey is going to walk through as part of this design guideline. This is something that's been developed originally by Jordan Valley Water Conservation District. It's been embraced by nearly every water conservation district, in addition, including central Utah. And it's a way of encouraging water-wise design for single family in particular that's easy to understand and easy to implement. And, so it's, and it's also not scary. It's not looking like spiky, as they say, spiky landscapes that look foreign and odd, uh, <laughs> which a lot of the earlier landscapes in my own yard look like. So, I would say uh, that, it, that it's, it's trying to make it look as much as a typical landscape as possible, but at the same time that you achieve water savings. If we go to the next page, section C is then talking about the requirements for all those other types of uses, and that it walks through the sections of it, starts off with you know, general what, what they need to consider when they're designing the landscape, plant selection, and then the landscape and plan document package is what I was talking about, that it's, it's requiring that a landscape plan be submitted, an irrigation plan be submitted, that they uh, provide as part of those these calculations of what your water use is and how much of that water you're using, and that you show where your zones are so that you have like plants in like areas. That's one of the concepts of good water-wise design is that if you have an area of lawn, for example, that you don't irrigate it with a system that's irrigating a low water area. So it's what we call putting them in hydro zones. And again, something that any landscape architect would understand and very easily. It's actually the way that most landscape architects design all their projects today. And then, and so it just walks through all the details. So that's the, I'd say the thing that for most people looking at that is going to be the most confusing part of the, if there's any confusing part of this ordinance. If you're not a professional, some of this is going to look like Greek to you. But because it's required that a landscape architect is involved with this or a professional, uh, it's, that message is getting to them and it's giving them, them the right information so that they can do their job correctly. If we go to the next section, um, this was with where it came up. It's called Section E, but here it's e D, so there seems to be a little, we'll have to rectify that. We caught that bit yeah. when we looked at it yesterday. Uh, but um, we do talk about, you know, these general ideas that might apply to any project, which is what, you know, what is how you want an irrigation system to operate. The use of mulch is a big principle of landscape, uh, um, of water-wise landscape. If you don't, every areas that stone is a mulch. So when you see stone around um, as a material on the surface, 
it's you often use to keep water in the ground. It's not for the look of it. And the other type of mulch you probably know is bark mulch that is shredded bark mulch. You have to refresh it every few years. But the pr main purpose of that is not the look of it so much as it keeps weeds from growing and it also keeps water in the ground. And it doesn't really matter if you use stone or if you use uh, bark mulch. Then we talk about sort of the pros and cons of using both of them. And then, you know, when you have lawn, that it makes sense that, it, that you don't have these skinny little strips. You're not encouraged to have skinny little six foot or five foot wide lawn areas that are really hard to, to use. So, um, and then we talk about artificial turf not being permitted. I know we talked about that in the joint session. There were some uh, discussions about that. And we also talk about that uh, in the section that uh, for everything except single family that uh, there is no, and I guess that's still up for debate, Dave, the idea of whether um, z zero scape is going to be permitted for single family or not, correct? I think, yes, so um, this is still kind of a real time thing, like I said, Brandon and I just talked about this yesterday. And Are you guys going to Rochambeau? To uh, see <laughs> or, uh, I think we're on the same page, and the way it's written right now, zero scape and I got to be careful to really enunciate that the right way. Zero scape is not permitted. And we would take the position that it has not been permitted in the past. So that's not a change. That's okay. where we're at. So artificial turf and zero scape are not permitted on any. Oh, artificial turf where it can be seen from the road. Today, our ordinance Allows talks it? about live turf grass. So we would say that today, artificial turf is not allowed. And it's even a little bit more explicit with what's proposed tonight, but I don't think the standard changes. But you can, but in the, what I read, it, you can have it in your backyard. backyard. But did we put that in there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. As long as you not, can't not, see it. Not, it's not seen sides. from the street, right? Okay. okay. Correct. Sure. That is real. And then there is, you did talk about, uh, you know, there is some discretion here, for, especially for selection of street trees and uh, trees in general other things uh, that it will be up to the community development director to make uh, decisions whether or not they can deviate from what's stated. So if somebody comes in with a tree that's not on our list, he can review it and approve it if it makes sense. Okay, next page. And then that uh, section on, as I mentioned, the construction inspection, basically how to, once this is starting to be installed, how it's going to be regulated and how it's going to be uh, officiated. And this is, you had a lot of this in your previous ordinance. We just tried to make it much more um, streamlined. Uh, we also, you had a section that dealt with street, street trees and with park strips separately. They've been integrated into this chapter, so you no longer have two chapters that deal with landscape design. You have all in one now, which is going to make it a lot easier for any designer or any people using this. And then the links and references is all those different agencies. And we've, we've done it in a, um, actually as a matrix, so that it mentions each of the, the links, and then it says what it pertains to. So it's going to be really easy for the public to use it to say, I'm interested in how to improve my soil. They can just look down that column and look at the references and they don't have to fumble to, around to try to find things. So we're trying to make it really easy to people to get other access that we don't cover in detail in this document or in the, the design document that we're going to present later. So we go to the next page. I'll try to be quicker here. This is, uh, we just had somebody in our office prepare sample documentation pa um, uh, drawings. So this is a typical site that might be in the city to show them what might be what it might this documentation set might look like for a larger project. So this will be great for the landscape architects and others to see, okay, this is what we you want as far as a table for the water use. This is what our schedule of water use might look like. This is how we show drip irrigation drawings on a site. This is how plants and where we might have mulch, what type of mulch, how you call it out on a drawing. So we think this is going to be, I've never seen any other community do something like this. 
So I think this is going to be something that's going to make it really helpful for meeting, setting up a standard for what you're expecting and getting that as a result in, in the future. And real quick, I'll go through the other components of this. If you go to the next page. Which part haven't you seen other communities do, Mark? Uh, actually put in those sample drawings that are very detailed so that they can see an example of what a, that documentation set that the city's asking for looks like. And so that this is going to be, a, and I think my understanding is the city is going to put this as a link to a reference on your web page somewhere just so they can be easily accessed. Okay. It doesn't seem irregular to me, but maybe I'm not understanding because master any larger development has to have a full set of landscape plans. But how are those different? Uh, a community might not show what they actually look like. So that's what we're, we're providing samples. Okay. So they can see that it, we, I, I'm also, um, um, a, I, I do plan review for a couple of communities. And we find that some of the smaller projects, they just don't understand what's expected. And so by actually showing them a sample drawing here, it's probably going to go a long ways to show them how to, how to, how to pull one of these together. For the larger projects where they bring in a, a, a landscape architect that is more regularly doing this, it's not an issue. But it, we find it's for some of the smaller projects. It'll help small guys, but yeah. the bigger, they'll still cut and paste from their past projects and put it on the page. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we go to the next. This is our, our, your shade tree list was very uh, relatively small before. Not that we wanted to make it large um, for its own sake, but that we've broken it down into the size of trees. And the size of trees should relate to the width of your park strips. So the wider your park strip is, the larger that your tree can be. And that's just a function of the way that trees grow. If you have more soil underneath it, it can support a larger tree. And we want a healthy, as I mentioned, a healthy tree system, an urban tree system. So if where you have very small planting areas, they should be small or very narrow trees. And then as it widens, you can get larger trees in there. And so we have a list of the allowed trees in each of those categories from small, medium, and large. And then we have a list of trees that are prohibited for a variety of reasons. They drop a lot of leaves or they lift up and lift up the concrete. They have aggressive root systems. They might just be junk trees that they have a lot of seeds that come down and you know those kinds about, of trees. What about palm trees? Well, if it can grow here, I think we'd permit it. <laughs> that would be unusual. So I, I think that I would like to see that. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so you've got a, a very thorough list now. And I think this is probably the most thorough that I've ever seen anywhere in Utah. And that's what it looks like here. They're pretty easy to understand. Again, these are done in a matrix format. And okay, we were just going to go over the re residential design guide book, but I think that if we have time and if you're willing to listen to Aubrey, she'll walk you through it. Is that okay? Here from Rachel. I just, there was a mention of shrubbery and you didn't quote Monty Python. I didn't. And I was surprised you didn't, thought so. <laughs> he did in his mind. I did too. <laughs> Do you mind pulling this up? It's in Dave's memo kind of near the end, this, this document. Is it further down this friend? Yeah, it's document you just have on your screen. Sorry, no. This one. Thank you. And I do have a printed version of the guidebook and the tree list. So if you wanted to pass it around and look at it, look at it later. Thank you. Sometimes that's easier. So I'll just do a quick run through of this guidebook. I think it's been established what it's for and who the audience is. And I actually had a lot of fun putting this together. It's, it's meant to be approachable, easy to understand, actionable. Um, for people who maybe don't have an understanding of landscape design or water-wise um, principles. So next page, please. 
Uh, so here is the gibberish letter, just a placeholder for the mayor to summarize kind of what the city's plans are, why they're doing this, how to use this guide, where to find more information, whatever he'd like to say. And it's it's called Lorem Ipsum. It's just a placeholder language. It's um, in the design software. So that's there. Uh, this is the table of contents. Pretty short guide. It's only 24 pages long in total. Um, next page. Uh, so introduction. Um, a lot of this has been discussed. Why conserve water? Talks about water-wise landscapes and specifically in Utah. Uh, why that matters. Next page. And then this goes into landscape design simplified, the local scapes approach, which we've talked a little bit about. Um, it's a five-step approach. And so the next section goes into each of those five steps. And next page. So first, central open shape. This is to create a focal point. Simple, practical shapes work best, and it's often flat. Um, and then it just describes it in greater detail. And then each of these has just some imagery to help people kind of envision what this could look like. Uh, next, please. Uh, gathering areas, areas meant to passively be enjoyed. Um, they can be any size or shape. They include hardscape elements often, such as patios, seating areas, courtyards, decks. Um, preferably no lawn, plants, or water is required in these areas, and they are meant to be low maintenance. Uh, so there's some examples of what a uh, gather gathering area may look like. Next page. Uh, third element, activity zones, areas that have specific dedicated uses, um, increased yard functionality while decreasing yard work is kind of the goal here, and no lawn. Um, so here's some examples, trampoline, a little play area, or maybe gardening. Next page. Uh, so fourth element, you fill in our paths. So no lawn here. This is meant to connect different parts of your yard, all those different spaces we've already um, talked about. And there's some examples of some different paths and how they could look. Next, please. And last of all, filling it in with planting beds. Um, should be Utah friendly, properly located, and watered efficiently. Uh, so these are the design elements, and the next section of the guide dives into the principles, and they're meant to be used in tandem um, so that people understand um, why they're doing certain things with their yards um, in a simple way. Um, so this goes through, I believe there are seven principles. This is from Utah State University's um, Center for Water Efficient Landscaping. So we've linked uh, websites and resources throughout this next section. Uh, so first, start with a plan. It goes through that first principle, uh, talks about turf grass, and then there's some considerations and resources. Yep, keep going. Soil. Next. Proper plant selection and placement, why it's important. Um, again, some more resources, mulch. Irrigation. And then I believe the last one is a landscape maintenance. So that's kind of how it's organized. Uh, next page. And then the last part of the guide is inspiration and resources. So it talks about the flip your strip programs that are available. Um, there's some demonstration gardens uh, throughout the state that would be easily to, to easy to visit from Spanish Fork. Um, and then some design inspiration on the last couple of pages. Thank you. And we organize them by lot size. So there's a large lot, medium-sized lot, and small lot that just show people, hey, your yard doesn't have to look like a barren wasteland. You can have plant material. Um, and here's how that looks like with the different design elements applied. Um, so they're labeled there. Well, yep, keep going. Chicken coop. Chickens uh, in a landscape design. That's yeah, <laughs> you can have a chicken coop. Uh, so yeah, there you go. You can see different sizes. And uh, you can kind of see there's a key on the bottom that helps people see, oh, OK, so that's a central open shape. So it can be an oval or a square or um, be located in the front yard, in the backyard. So hopefully giving people just a little bit more um, a visual of what, what their yard could look like. And hopefully they get excited about it. Uh, next page. 
Uh, this is the resource matrix Mark mentioned. So all the hyperlinks that are found throughout the guide are listed here, and then they are organized by topic. Um, so those principles that are discussed, you can see turf grass, um, and then with a check mark next to the link, that means, oh, okay, this, this resource will have information on turf grass or soil or mulch. Uh, so that will be available. Uh, next page. And then just a concluding statement from Utah's Regional Water Conservation Goals Report. I really love the last sentence. Um, I think this speaks to people here. We do not conserve water because we have a wet or dry year. We conserve because as Utahns, we are not wasteful. So just summarizing the purpose of this guide and um, becoming more water efficient and water wise. And then I think that's it. I think it just concludes with work cited. So if folks wanted to dive in more, they could. Uh, so any questions? I, I envision this being on the city's website, but it could be a variety of formats. It could be printed out as a guidebook. Um, I think there's some talk about mailers. Maybe you create a postcard that talks about where to find it. So that would be um, just some strategies for disseminating the information to the public. So yeah, any questions? Any questions? No, no question for me, but I will echo, it would be nice if this was on the city's website. Right. And what is I, the plan? I think it would have been oh, awesome when I bought I mean, my home. If I had this information. Mm -hmm. Just because it would have made my planning more purposeful. It would have been nice. I, I like the idea of it as a resource that, that there is a lot of things that could be very helpful to somebody. As you look at the sample lots, there's nothing to be, I mean, they're very attractive. There's an area to go throw oh, the yeah. ball in. There's uh, nice sitting areas. That, that there's a lot of, I mean, I wish my yard was as well thought out as that was. It's really functional space. Mm -hmm. It's how I take away, and I, I love that about it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you wouldn't send out a 24-page mailer to everybody in the city, but you could send a postcard out. That and then a link to the 24-page. Right. right. Yeah. Exactly. You all get a city bill. It could go in, you know, it could be included in your city bill at times, too. Aubrey and Mark. In the city letter. From me, in the thank bill. you. I think I'm yeah, the only one who reads that. Thank you, guys. And we can invite Mark and Aubrey to join us with our SF-17 folks to do a 10-minute, 15-minute or whatever. We talked about that, didn't we? Am I throwing that up? I mean, we, we really, this, this needs to be. Have them be on studio chatter. You know, presented to the community. I think Aubrey would fit right in. Yeah, she would. She'd be great. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and if that's, I guess, part of the, I would say thank you. I really will echo that. Uh, these are great tools for the community. Um, I think not only are they appropriate, I really like, um, it, you know, kind of the positive. I view this as just being a, a tool that we can use to, um, you know, not so much focus on what we don't want people to do, but to really focus on what you can accomplish and, you know, still um, abide by the you know, overall need to, to be conservation minded. Um, really appreciate the work. I apologize. Last couple of days have been busy. I didn't get a chance to look at your presentation before tonight, or I would have stowed a lot of what I started with tonight. So sorry about that. But uh, um, again, we appreciate the work. If um, you see anything in the next several weeks that you think we should look at further, uh, we're happy to do that. Shauna, um, uh, whether you intended to or not, you gave us some great feedback just by way of how you read you know, that one particular section. Um, uh, there's some need, I think, to be more clear with that. And I don't think that's that hard to do. So I'd like to retool that a little bit. I, um, I think that a general thing, too, I mean, in addition to something like, I, you could put a yard design or a, something, but there really ought to be, I, for instance, me and the 25 other people that read that, uh, the awesome mailer that comes with my city bill. I love it so much. But that's some place where, you know, like, what can I put in my garbage can or what can I? I think something in there like, when thinking about your yard, thou shalt, and thou shalt, you know, thou shalt not, you know, X, Y, and Z. And remember that you've got to, you know, 
a, you can't stow cars that are, I mean, you know what I mean? Like broken yes. down cars in your yard. Yeah. It, things like that to remind people as well. Put it out in other places. Honestly, I love it. I really do. Every medium that we have, every resource, we want to use them to, to help uh, encourage people to follow best practices. And I mean that in a nice way. I love that I newsletter. I get right. so much good information from that. And, I don't know and the there's way more than, there's yeah. actually way more than 25 of us that read it. So I appreciate it. 35. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so this is a public hearing, correct? It, yes, we have it scheduled tonight mm -hmm. for a public hearing. Honestly, in the hope that you're comfortable to make a recommendation, even mm -hmm. perhaps with conditions. Uh, we've also scheduled a public hearing on this with the city council for their next meeting. Um, but at the same time, we want to get this right. We want you to be comfortable before we move forward. So I think you have every option tonight as to, to how you proceed forward. But because we have advertised it for a public hearing, um, I know the gentlemen that are here aren't necessarily here for this item. They might have some input to offer. But mm -hmm. either way, if you could open the public hearing. And yeah. And then we have some more discussion after that. So we'll uh, open this topic up, the, the landscaping. Uh, Title 15 amendments up to the public hearing. If there's anybody here to speak on that, would welcome you to come up. Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Commissioners, what are your thoughts on what we've heard and moving forward? Do you have any comments? My thought is on the heels of what we've discussed and what we hope to be the intent, which, thank you, has actually helped me quite a bit on flushing out what we hope this is. I'd like to read the code again in light of what we hope it is um, before our next meeting. So my, uh, my idea is to read it and, uh, and table it now and, and vote on it next time and reread it in light of what we hope to, hope to achieve with it. The only comment I have on that is, is Dave provided this to us a month ago in, in a very similar format and with hopes we'd have some action on it. And so we've had it before us. He, he also just said that if we have any recommended, recommended changes even after this meeting, he's fine with that too. But you're wanting to get this in front of the council also. I would like to. It's not imperative. I mean, okay. honestly, it's there's there, I've, I'm kind of split on that it's from my association with you. Um, I see that we've been having that information, but I too would also like to dig more into it because there's, there's a lot of things that were presented just tonight that I wasn't remembering from my old our past presentation on this that I'd like to dig a little bit more into some questions I might have. And Shauna did bring up some things that uh, may want to be looked at a little bit more. Uh, I have one question that I didn't see addressed in the document. I, re I read through it, but uh, considering that there will be inspections and sign-offs on the projects after they're done, uh, is there going to be a cost associated with this and will it be part of the bill of the uh, of uh, is it going to be part of the building permit process and be inspected just like any other phase of the building process but not for single family homes correct no no, no. just for other, all the other for, projects so yet you know it's going to act it's going to add to the cost. Somebody's going to have to do that inspection, and there'll be it will be a cost associated with that in time and effort. Somebody's got to go over it, approve it, make sure that it's being put in correctly, and then sign off that it was done. And uh, so there's a charge for every other inspection that we have in the city. Would there be a charge for this, or is it something that we consider to be a uh, community-wide project that is worthy of our attention without having an additional cost borne by the applicant the costs are borne by applicants and what we would be doing in terms of administering these requirements would be as best as i can think of right now identical to what we've been doing in the past so in as much as there would not be a change uh, we have the expenses involved or the expenses that the city normally would incur to inspect the completion of improvements built into our fee structure for different types of applications. And that's how those things are funded by the developer. Those costs are 
distinct from any other sources of revenue that the city has. And would our city inspectors be uh, the inspectors on this and would they be trained in what they're looking for? I mean, we're asking that these things be done by professionals and that they're, and that we have designs, you know, uh, approved. So do, you know, is that gonna require somebody specialized training? There's a difference between saying, yeah, you know, the, the connection's okay to the water main and, and then really inspecting what we're talking about tonight, the, the water application. Um, most of what we're talking about tonight from an installation perspective, I don't think requires more expertise than what we've had in the past. And honestly, That's Mr. Fine. Snyder has taken at least the lead on making sure that landscaping gets installed according to approved plans. Um, and that will likely continue. And I, he's very capable of, of continuing to do that now. Um, Down to the caliper size of the tree. Well, That's one, true. Well, one thing I don't recall, and I was thinking thinking about it, is well, do. if landscape plans typically include water consumption. Okay, thank you. Now, and that, that was a point where I actually... I actually wanted to take the time to look back at some of my landscape plans mm -hmm. to see if that's normal because I don't recall seeing water consumption tables for the landscaping. Well, for single family homes, it's kind of a different thing. And for single family, homes, single it's family a homes, we don't require it. We're not yeah. worried. He's about talking about for we're talking about everything else. Work. Your development, yeah. and, not your not home. Any, gotcha. Gotcha. So, so what would happen, Sean, is right. all non-single family home development in the city of Spanish Fork would require that. Right. And I'm right. just I'm. I wanted to do some digging on how out of out of the ordinary that is. I, I don't know the answer. Right. The review of plans that comply with you know kind of the water budget concept and other aspects of what's proposed here for multifamily and non-residential development, we will rely on Mr. Vlasic, maybe Aubrey both, to get us off on the right foot as we're making sure that we're reviewing the right things, making sure that um, we're getting the calculations right and different things of that sort. And I don't know if that's helping us through our first two or three or 20, uh, or if we have even maybe a longer kind of relationship just to help make sure that that happens. We will have to adjust to that. So on the plan review side, certainly we'll be making some changes, but we review plans today. I don't think it's a different it's not more work necessarily. It's it's us gaining some expertise that we don't have now, and again, we have some support to help get us there. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't view it really as being a change. This was I, asked I, prior to, but how much of a change is this going to be? I mean, it is. On one hand, on one hand, it sounds like a drastic change, but we've been requiring landscaping and everything else prior to this mm -hmm. and we're tweaking some things about what can be done what can't be done but is it that much different at the end of the day from what we're doing now in my mind the approach is very different it really is but the okay. the purpose of it the goal the on expertise non, that's on non-residential involved yeah, again so yeah focusing on that thank yes. you i mean we have required for the past many years right. a landscape architect to prepare landscape plans right so but one um, one thing that's different is it correct me if i'm wrong uh, that i recall is we're going to require that the natural native landscaping that that we don't use more water than what would have occurred in that air, on that piece of land Anyway, is that historically. correct? Yeah, historically. Which so, is interesting. It's, that's, I think that's new. It seems new to me. Is it? It seems new compared to anything we've ever done. Well, if it, it's, if it's new it's farm to me. Ground, okay. sure. That's the part that's new. For sure. Okay. But if it's farm ground, you're going to use far less water anyway. Because of the, mm -hmm. the hard surface that, you know, when somebody comes oh. in and As you're converting from an agricultural acres, use yes, to, yeah. You know, Definitely. there's going to be less water use there. And we, don't, we certainly... You know, the goal is to not use four acre feet per acre, which is the norm for grass, hay, corn, you know, all of those things. We use far less than that anyway in what we do now. And so uh, we hope to fine tune this and, and be even better at our conservation. And I certainly support that. It just seems like what we're doing is we're sharpening the tool that we're using. 
and I and I fully support it. I think that it's a great idea, and uh, I think that uh, the community will be helped all the way around because uh, right now we have a lot of places where there's more water that's going on to the parking lot or the sidewalk than there is on to the plants, and the plants are being overwatered, and you know you can step that's, off into that's just the city buildings. Yeah, you know so. Yeah, just, uh, just, just I'm all for, I'm all for it, and it's just such a way to. Talk that first. Yeah. So I think the one area, like just my, yeah. the one we're talking about when we're talking about cost is you're going to see. The gentleman that was here last meeting that had the the, the it's going to end up being a threeplex that he's putting in. He it was would, a conditional then, use permit infill overlay, and it added two more. So now there's four on that property. Yeah, so that was he, my next question. He's going to have a lands. He's going to have to hire a landscape yeah, architect right. now, and where that was an expense that we would have required of him to have before. Any fourplex now? Anything a uh, uh, three pet? So you're going to see or larger. those smaller ones, like we see often. They're going to have another consultant. They're going to have to bring in. Somebody's doing a bigger development. They've already they're already planning on that. That's right. Somebody's in single family. They don't they don't have to worry about that. It's going to be that middle of the yeah those the smaller developments are going to have that added right. cost. And, and it is a that cost. is simply how we propose it. If you feel differently, feel like you know maybe. I'm not sure that's a negative at all. I just I, I yeah. Just, given the conversation that we had, it it actually seems like a plus. Yeah. Um. My so my two things. I honestly, I think that waiting one more month and giving it one more shot, one more little, just to sharpen it a little more is good. And I think for me, the thing that's most important is to all get on the same page about what on here is E to me. What is required for all projects and what is, um, and what is recommended for and, and what is recommended water wise as demonstrated or whatever, you know. I really want to take a stab at that, but I'd welcome any, if you have any really specific language you want us to include, anything you want to provide along those lines, I welcome for sure. Because on both this and on there, it's a lot more requirements even for single and twin homes than what you stated at the beginning. And, and I, so and the wording between the two didn't we want match to up in some areas. Yeah, so I, we just need that to be totally clear. I appreciate that. Let me, I mean, so it's I think January. The can I just throw this out? Like, <laughs> it's not like a lot of people are getting out next month to start to install. Right. But it's good to get it approved. Landscape it improvement. So taking another month now, probably as good of a time of year as any to do that. Um, we would have to re-advertise for a public hearing with the city council, which is an absolute piece of cake. Yep. So if you want to take more time, that's... I think all of our feelings were pretty much along that, those lines. Um, then why I would like to just say, it? I would like to just encourage us to, I mean, we've had this, we I, actually thought, I'm speaking to myself, because I, I think my handout got left in the backseat of a plane. I, br I brought mine with me. Uh, to, to go through and, and actually follow through and give Dave our comments. Agreed. So a motion to table it? Or we, do we take a motion for that? A motion, I motion to continue the um, uh, Title 15 amendments proposal and uh, public hearing uh, until February, our February meeting. Do we need to redo the public hearing? Dave for we'll planning commission. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, it looks like that motion is approved to table or to continue this topic until our next planning zoning commission. Thank you so much for your great, I, you guys are inspiring. Thank you. Uh, we hope, yeah, I think it's going to work out well. I agree with you. I think that we, it's going to be beneficial to take a closer look at Fine too. For all landscapes, to make sure that it makes sense. Because if, sure. you know, if you're catching things, then Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. See ya. Our next uh, item for for Special. you is the the concept review for the Vesta. Yeah. Project. This is our other main event, right, for the night. Um, we've had a chance to go out and look 
Uh, some of our folks got out before tonight. A few of us went out tonight also. Dave forgot the sleds. <laughs> At the sleds, yeah. yeah. I walked all. <laughs> I walked all over it with with the wild turkeys and the deer during my Christmas break. It didn't take long this afternoon to get uncomfortable and to be ready to leave. Yeah, you know, really. So uh, standing out there, <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, it, I probably don't have a whole lot to add to the conversation other than to maybe give a recap on some of the highlights that I'm aware of by way of things that have happened since we last discussed that this with you as the commission we've met with these gentlemen and their consultants for example to talk about access and getting uh, a means of access potentially that would be dedicated just for this area that I think this image shows well that um, is proposed to be developed residentially and I'll maybe let Mr. Bankhead, whoever, speak more to that. Um, that has been a concern for staff um, for a handful of different reasons. Um, but, uh, you know, as much as anything, as staff, we're still really just looking to get the Planning Commission's thoughts on, on the big concept of residential development here. And then I think that, that potentially um, evolves quickly into, okay, if, if that's um, an appropriate thing to consider, then maybe what does that look like? In the last meeting, we talked about you know, maybe like an estate lot kind of concept. Um, the applicants have proposed something you know, pretty distinct from that, um, multifamily, townhome kind of development. Um, and we've talked about you know, maybe a mix of some different things. So uh, from my perspective, understanding that there are real constraints Still, it's kind of a blank slate. And as much as the tonight, we just wanted to give uh, these gentlemen as the, the property owners an opportunity to, to confer with you guys and get your thoughts and ideas. And um, if you don't have any questions for me, I'll just be quiet. Uh, Chairman, would it be OK if I take a stab at some of our conclusions from earlier? And then you guys fill in the blanks if I, I miss things, or you do for them, feedback? Do you want to do that now, or after the applicant has the chance to address this? Whatever you think. If, I think you want to go now. So no, I'm why, good. why don't you go ahead and address those now? I think they're here for feedback, so, but <laughs> I'm good either way. So our conclusion, my conclusion was I'd love to see it both ways, both ways meaning with townhomes or, or with some sort of single family home lots or maybe even the third way, a combination of the two. But the biggest issue is figure, figuring out the access. So those three future site plans need to have the access figured out. Um, we talked a few, different, a few different avenues for that access. All of them are varied in different cost uh, obligations. Um, one thought that uh, Todd had was to potentially widen the existing road to have more a, a section that's dedicated for the residences versus the industrial office uh, space. Another thought was to potentially use the existing road that's there now, and if you could have a different road in between the, the, inter, the intersection on Highway 6 and the road that's there now for the industrial uh, as an, another cheaper option. One other option was to potentially have a, some sort of bridge over the ravine uh, with uh, a, a walkway, something like the Sky Bridge at City Creek that would be really cheap, but wouldn't cost very much. And then, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm just kidding. I was kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, with some retail nearby, uh, above the ravine, so you could have pads, niche shops, boutique, yeah, things like that. But something like that was another idea um, that was floated. Yeah, that was that was a that was a joke, but and then some sort of access um, to the west of the existing one has also been discussed, which you guys are more familiar with. But we're trying to think through ideas that would make it uh, more cost effective for you, but still provide uh, a dedicated ingress egress for the residences. Um, but uh, again, kind of reiterate once with the access issues figured out in a way that staff likes see a townhome proposal, single family home proposal, and if you wanted to try and put them together, put them together, proposal. And I, I like, that's a good summary of our discussion as we're on our so. field trip. I, I kind of like the idea of, 
of the mix of designs of the your, your option three was what seems to fit most into my mindset of where I'd like to step property Tell them why. why. Why, Todd? Well, I just think, I mean, we have great, there's great potential here. I mean, we have a good buffer in the townhomes between the the industrial usage, and the, the warehouses. And we like the but berm. You like the berm. I like the yeah, berm. Uh, that's that. good separate. Uh-huh. And when you're standing down this lower band, this is a little bit higher, but when you're down in this area, you can't, you can't see over here, but you're still dealing with your neighbor as a warehouse. Whereas when you have down here, these are, these are, I mean, they're beautiful lots. Beautiful lots are special. I, you yeah. don't think that when you look at it from this aerial yeah. view, yeah. but when you stand there and you know the area, you're looking over a, a beautiful golf course, you have a, a great mountain range behind you. <clears throat> uh, you do have a wind that blows through there, but it, <laughs> it's a great, it's a very good area. I think it'd be, uh, the, the lots would go quickly and for a, a good or amount like of money. like a single family yeah. cottage type. Something, something along those lines. Something mixed density, yeah. And it fit with what we're, what we're wanting to do overall in Spanish work, you know. So, but I do think the the access is a. I, I share the staff's concern about that. Um, but I do think some element as a as a buffer through here of the townhomes, I I would personally be in favor of. Well said. Could, could I come up? Absolutely. Please. You came all this way. Yeah. <laughs> I came to listen to the landscaping hey. discussion, to be honest. If you'll state your name for the record. And- John Bankhead with uh, Vesta Partners. Um, I think all those are great, and I really appreciate that you guys would take the time to go out and look at that. I know that's not on your normal uh, circuit, but it is, it's kind of an, a unique sight as you drive up in there. It was quite different mm-hmm. walking it than looking at it on Google Earth. Um, I'd love to have like a, a conversation of, and, and I like hearing what you guys are trying to achieve because um, that really helps us. I'm going to talk through a couple of issues that the site has, one of which is access and utilities because these are costs, and then we can kind of iterate to what we think ultimately works. Um, it's, it's zoned industrial, and I'm honestly not that thrilled about what we can do on that industrial. It's kind of a, a weird piece for that. But um, if you'll go uh, up, we had an earlier site plan, um, and this shows perhaps more of what we were thinking on the access, and let me talk through a couple of, uh, right there. So it's my understanding that in general, if we have over, over 50 um, lots that we need, one, a secondary access for fire, which, is, which I think we could get a couple of different ways, but but staff feels, and I can see where they're coming from here, that having a separate access away from uh, the, the trucks would be really nice and give it a really upscale feel. So we worked with our engineer and with, uh, with Mike here at the city to come up with this lower road that comes off at the intersection of Powerhouse and lines up. That, that road is actually a pretty reasonable road. I think it could be done to look really nice. We feel it would give a really upscale really great feel as you go up, go up through the oaks it's it's not an inexpensive road and so one of the one of the balances that i think we'll go back and look at is if you're going to spend roughly a million and a half dollars on that bridge ballpark um you know how do we amortize that over a certain number of units if that's 40 or 50 single family lots that may or may not be cost prohibitive. We have a similar situation and there's no sewer really anywhere close to the site. So get it, we'll either need to do a sewer lift station or something like that. Um, those are kind of the two challenges we're working with. And, and kind of the third is we have 80 acres of developable ground. We have 400 feet of actual lot frontage. And so those are some of the constraints we're trying to think through. But um, if I heard correctly, what you generally thought might be a good strategy is to try to keep kind of warehouse, then a bit of a buffer of a higher density townhome product, then maybe some cottage or quarter acre-ish lots down, that my down lower. I, I That's Joseph something like that you guys would generally... Minimum of quarter acre. Minimum? Well, that if you've walked the edge of that hill, there's not another place in South Utah County that has that. No. With the river below it, the canal is there, true. But to be 
uh, there's not a lot of uh, places you'll see in Utah County that uh, has the view of a golf course, although it's limited. It's pretty awesome. But you've spot. got an awesome view of what's called Snell's Canyon across there. Uh, people like to see the windmills. And so what I'm saying is, is that, uh, is that that's, that's one of the few places where that kind of a lot is at a premium. Just across Highway 6 and across the other way towards Mapleton, they're building in those, in those uh, little swales and hills in there, and they're selling lots for over $500,000 a lot. I know. But they're also, they're also large lots, nothing smaller than I think those acre. ones are on the ski lake, John. Yes. <laughs> I so, want that you know, awesome. sadly they're not. Sadly they're not. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I think I think that uh, I think that a, a great opportunity would be missed. And as far as the cost of the road, uh, I don't know how many uh, units are in this drawing. The, this one shows about 150. Yeah, 150. The cost of building roads around 150 lot or 150 units would be in excess of a million bucks anyway. Well, the road, the road is, we kind of, we, we had a, an engineer draw it and got a rough estimate. It hasn't been detailed, but it's out about a million and a half dollars. About a million and a half. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So we'll have to work through that and just see. Right. Um, I, we are not at all that's, opposed to the mix there, and we'll just have to go back and see what we can actually. And that's for this, that out. you're specifically saying for this section. Yeah, but I'm curious you're if you would You're not talking about mind. the whole rest of the development. No, no just the bridge section. talking about your bridge section. over yeah. the canal in this well, section. Once we are on to the development, it's going to be a reasonably comparable thing to f folks that are dealing with less yep. topography. I mean, we'll have some retaining walls and some other things, but those aren't, those aren't unique. It's just the access there in right. the sewer. And the cost of the lot will go up exponentially, that considering where it's at. You can't yeah. just say, well, a quarter acre lot over between the tracks is this, and that's what this is worth. It's going to be worth far more. No, I, I agree with you so there. So that you know, uh, we're talking about apples, and I don't know even oranges. You know, we're we're talking Come about plots. two different we'll things here because of the location, 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 and you have a great opportunity there to to have something that could really be an asset to your company. Actually, you know, because you guys are the ones that are coming in and 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 making an impact here on everything that's there. Uh, it's it's a great place and I think it's a great opportunity to have something that everybody could be uh, uh, proud of. The road that's there now is, is your private road, is that right? Yeah, and I'd, I'd be curious, uh, you, there were a couple of thoughts or comments about, you know, could we do something else with that road? I'd love to get your, you know, we, we thought of this access and that's been working with staff. Certainly open to other ideas if there are other I ideas. I like this work. way better than having a an auxiliary side road access through there. This is this we, is better than what we were talking about. Yeah, yeah. we were talking about how many people uh, are employed here now, how many trucks go in and use that road. Uh, the trucks usually aren't backed up; they come in at all hours of the day and night. Yeah. And there's usually not more than a, a couple on that road at a time, if that. If that. Uh, this is. Uh, a little bit of an issue in the morning when all of those people are coming to work, but if you're not coming to work at six o'clock, you don't see. Yeah. That. What but is, anyway, what uh, is the truck traffic? Right. Do you know? Yeah, we have a traffic engineer, and we we ran it at full build out uh -huh. uh, with 150 units. And the traffic report, from a functional standpoint, I can't remember the total number of peak trips. I want to say it was. I've got this in my notes, but but it was like a hundred. I think it was max 180 at the peak hour. And so, um, and that included residential and otherwise. We, we're, we're comfortable based on preliminary conversations with the traffic engineer that we can work through the traffic issues. I think the access was more a response to do people want to feel like they're driving home through an industrial park and having that mix of uses. Mm -hmm. And I think, I do agree that this, this concept will feel really nice. And, and, but it also has to be done well. We can't have a cheap looking thing because this is like a really great trail and they have the springs and everything up there. And so it needs to look intentional and well designed. Does, does staff have any concerns with the location of this being an approach? We would have to have, this is right at the bottom, right? You have- Is it directly across from River Bottoms? It is, the way they've shown it, yeah. Yeah, it so would, right is, there. we would That's purposely line, line it up. 
Well, your slowing down is going to have to be a deceleration lane. I mean, to turn into that. We do. I mean, we deal with that Probably all the time because I turn on and off turn, from yeah, the other way. That's what you're talking about, right? Yeah. The dedicated left hand. It's not too bad if this that's is all right. residential. Right. Yeah. There's plenty of room to add that. Yeah, I think there is. I think you're right. And okay. it's a 25 mile an hour road, technically. <laughs> technically. But I ride faster on my bike down. Five, forties. The it's, one thing. Yeah, there's the shoulder here is really big, so you can bump this. Like okay. Down. Yeah. 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 And it, it looks, the, the topography around it's pretty aggressive, but the actual road and intersection, it, it flattens out pretty nicely and where the, the city water building is, is in kind of a flat little spot down there. So it's not terrible at that spot. I love that idea of that connection. The, the only concern that I would have about traffic on Powerhouse, you do have a lot of people coming from the south that go to work there. Sure. It's not all up Highway 6. But this light now that's at Highway 6 is a, is a huge advantage. Man, it is it so good. It changes this a lot. Yeah. It changes it a lot. One concern that I have is that this light now has to, you know, I mean, obviously it spends more time with the traffic on Highway 6 than it does with the, with the, uh, with the traffic coming into it from Powerhouse. And by putting those extra units there, I don't want to see this get back up, you know, way down here because the, the you know, the, the light here, I don't know exactly how you we've, avoid that. We've started. You see how it's going to. If, oh, sorry. If they're only adding, well, you didn't say what you're adding. You're just, at no, peak no. it was 180. I, it, it might it's right now. You know, if the, the residential, right. whether it's 50 or 150, doesn't oh, do oh. much there the additional industrial traffic is going to in, in preliminary conversations with our with uh, hills engineering and haven't obviously run this by staff because we're pretty early th there's probably going to need to be some improvements it could be two left lanes a dedicated right turn there, there's probably going to need to be need to be something happen there so we don't have a bunch of trucks and other people queuing clear down onto powerhouse I reached out to uh, Dan Avila out at UDOT and started chatting with him about this intersection and what they have planned. And so we're starting to kind of see what UDOT might be thinking. So don't know where that ends up, but I, I believe that intersection may need some improvements. And if I remember right in talking with you last time, we were talking about uh, conceptually uh, doubling the size or doubling the area that there is there now. And so that could double the number of trucks, but very seldom. Now there's a truck there in this picture, but yeah. very seldom do we see two trucks that are there at the same time. And the other thing is, is that not all trucks turn left. Yep. Many of them are going back east and so they turn right. It may necessitate having to widen this area or something like you're talking about, but that's something that you ought to have to approve. But anyway, I. Right now, it's a pretty good, it's a, it is a good road. I, yeah, I really like it. So I talked to Ryan today, uh, the traffic engineer, and so most everything you said that was in our conversation, I think that's great. Uh, the other thought, concern, whatever we had is, um, this doesn't have a lot of data on it, right? It's not, a, it's not brand new, but it's not something that's been for a long time, right? Um, so as we add semis, as this comes back, even maybe two or three semis, if you're sitting or going to turn left, your vision, right, of a car that's coming around, you oh. have quite a ways to speed up before you make a cautious left. Um, mm. Obviously, we don't want to make this any uh, more complicated than it is, but we also don't want a bunch of residents to take that left. True. But again, as we said, there's plenty of space here to work with some lanes. Uh, this has significantly changed. I think a year ago, this would have been a no-go from the start just because this queued up well into this um, intersection. It was bad. Because the semi turning left was toxic. Awesome. This is so much better. Yeah. So anyway, but, but and it's well aware, well aware of that and we'll include that in this. And so. Mike, if we had the road that connected to, uh, that goes through Powerhouse into the river bottoms, then that would take care of some of that that goes this way. Yeah, uh, with not with the workers, but with the people who are leaving the residential area. Absolutely. And because they're at the bottom of the hill, their vision up the hill. Um, oh, it's limited. You can see pretty well. Again, they are going fast. So that is probably my main concern. The left-hand turn was someone going 45 instead of 25. Mm -hmm. um, 
we have budgeted a bucket of roofing nails. We'll just throw them out there every morning and <laughs> slow them right down. Have you talked? Have you talked with the East Bench Canal Company at all? About we have, and I, I, I know that they're there, and we've kind of done some work to kind of see what it would take to put a road across that in culvert. Right. But I haven't really reached out to them yet because I just wanted to see if this, if this was going to go anywhere. So They'll have a little bit of a concern, obviously, because this canal, up until now, the only thing they've had to worry about is wildlife. But with population going in here, that could be uh, something that they're really concerned about safety-wise. Yep. Safety, you know, yeah. and, and particularly if we have, uh, we will have young families and kids there. And so how we deal with that, th there's a whole litany of various easements, power lines, canals. Oh, yeah. As you dig into the, this, has got, this property has a lot going on. That was one of my concerns when I was walking it a couple of weeks ago was, because I was like, well, can you look up down onto the trail? I'm like, nope, there's a steep thing into there's a, a steep, canal or steep all bank. along there. So, so that, I think, you know, as we... Kids. If, if exactly. as we get into this, I think they're, uh, we need to preserve access to the canal for them. They need to be able to use it. It could actually be a great amenity to have a path next to the canal. We just need to appropriately deal with fencing and safety and people so, like that. Yeah, that canal actually goes right behind my property line, oh. um, just a, just barely that off the map. And, uh, and they actually, some, they actually cemented it over and- Covered it up. Covered it. Yeah. Not too long after mm -hmm. we moved in. It's in a box culvert. Yep. Well, that was that was actually fantastic feedback. So thank you for for going. We will go back to work and try to run some new concepts that mix the two uses. We're going to run some numbers, see what that looks like, and uh, we can report back. Is this the new concept or the old concept? This is the current concept. Really, it's the exact same thing you saw last time. The only real difference here is that we were trying to address the road. That's where we've done a lot of our work. And then we also put, there was a con, there was a comment last time about whatever goes here, the level of quality. And so we tried to pull some precedent images that we thought were higher quality and different than what we see uh, in, in a lot of developments. You could look at those and throw up yeah, and that would be okay yeah, too. Yeah, so, that just down? Yeah. but we yeah, just yeah. wanted, we, we thought that we want a different kind of product. We want to capitalize on the views. We want a lot of glass, um, some, you know, some natural materials would prefer this not to be a big stucco farm. Um, so those were some ideas, some things about them I like and others are not perfect, but. Yeah. I think some, this mid, this bottom with these, these nice balconies and views for that location would be, it, it helps sell places. Yeah. It views. is a really premium view location. So yeah. Thank you for thinking premium. None of those. All those look. You might be cautioned about flat roofs, as you know. Oh, I, I've, I've had a lot of good and bad experience. Now I'm looking at this picture, and they have really bad stucco on the right, so I apologize yeah. for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, use, we'll use a different group there, huh? Um, you can't get everything. But I appreciate your feedback. That's, that's where we are. We'll go back to work. We'll come back in a month if, if it maybe get some things out to you sooner about what that looks like and see what we can we can figure out with the road and We've some of these other issues. We've got a lot of landscaping things to read. Don't send it to us sooner. Then, oh, I'm going I'm to be reading <laughs> these. On this. Yeah. On your, <laughs> your, your phasing of this, are you going to be moving ahead with your industrial, your next three buildings, your warehouses, or would this go first? What's the Probably both at the same, both about at the same, same time. time. I mean, we would, so our, the other small zoning change that we will be asking for, and I just haven't even bothered is up on the very uh, at the intersection that right now is nothing the power company is the Spanish Fork Power is interested in taking an acre there and putting a substation which would be great for us it helps our industrial we we're also thinking of turning that into some kind of a retail I don't know if that's a convenience store or a mm. Starbucks that's a we're, we're still working through some issues there but would like to get going relatively quickly as soon as we can on the townhomes and the, we have a 300,000 foot um, building planned right next to the adjacent or adjacent to the existing building. We'd like to get that started if we can this year. So yeah. okay. I'd like Good. to get some things moving up there. Question I have in the, um, so John and you guys are talking about having single family homes back this to some extent, I don't know how much of it or all of it. Um, one thing for John might be helpful is, is there a density something he should be looking at or does yeah, it really matter? Yeah, they cover that. John, 
this John said at least a quarter acre. Quarter acre. Minimum. Or the single family, but what if he has townhomes with that? Or, or you along that he's hill? He's just referring along for the single family section. I'm just section. talking about the single family sure. section. But if he along. says, well, if I could fit 150 townhomes here and make it more dense, oh. then I can add all the single gotcha. family here. Yeah. Like a mix. Yeah. I yeah. think that might be too many townhomes for that you, section. You know, honestly, I. Because yeah. townhomes are tough to make work. And so they need to meet our standards for spacing, parking, all that on the top section, and then qu a minimum quarter acre, I think is what Dave is about to say. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, which is what I would say. Now he's getting clairvoyant. <laughs> yeah. Of course. Well, he did. If you he say did minimum say. quarter acre, I say minimum quarter acre, right? But I also would say, and I appreciate where Mike's coming from, but at this point, I would look at it differently in terms of like any thought about. I think at this point, excuse me, at this point in particular, it's about yeah. what potentially can work, mm -hmm. and you know, maybe we back into it from a number perspective from there, um, but rather focus on the design, and that's where sure. you know however much room you need to logically fit the product and the like that drives it, sure. and the number is just kind of the result. Um, yeah. Obviously, I, I like this better, you know, on what you've got drawn there with the, with more space and stuff. But considering what we've talked about with water, uh, wide stuff, you know, that's a lot of grass and a lot of open area to water. You're in a wind tunnel, and so it, it is harder to water, and it takes more water. It just does. And so, you know, you might want to squeeze some more density into that, but uh, that would just have to see what you come up with. This area though plays well with what we discussed in the landscaping. I mean, yeah. you can continue the natural plant life that's up on the mountains around that through this area and still have a very attractive uh, I think so area. Too. That's what's there now. Yeah, that's what's there now. Uh, that has never been farmed on that side. It's been grazed but not farmed. Didn't you say there's a lot of uh, there was oil dumping over there in that section? That came into play. Just no. <laughs> I always I, I thought it was new. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was just going to see what John was well, going to do. Well, right I thought it was well, nuclear waste well, from New York, and we <laughs> viewed that as a revenue source, I suppose. But um, no, I, 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 we've run into everything. I'm just easy with whatever happens. It's good. How far does your property line go down off from? It the basically hill? just goes to the far side of the canal. So the canal and the power lines there are basically on the property, Our but they property. have an easement. Yeah, it drops off pretty quickly. Well, okay. where I live, uh, you know, when you've got this kind of vegetation, my lot is a third acre lot. Well, it's, all, it's almost a, a half acre, but a lot of it is unbuildable and unusable yeah. other than to have the vegetation there. But the vegetation uh, but yet is it's, great. It's still, you know, like uh, the people before were talking about, uh, you know, having different uses in your yard. I have neighbors that have made trails through that and little places that uh, take a lot of maintenance, but they love to go in there and the kids go in. And I was out there thinking you get a big telephone pole and make the world's biggest rope swing over that ravine and it'd be pretty awesome. <laughs> Maybe you could put a... Uh, that would be awesome. Yeah. yeah, that won't work for liability issues. I'm sure the attorney will have fun well, with my idea. I like that you have liability. the, the path HOA provided the rope swing. <laughs> well, thank you. We've, we've, we've digressed. Large for it. We've still, digressed quite a bit. Do we have anything? We, we will Good go job, back. Chairman. You're doing a great job as the chairman today. <laughs> we will go back to work, but we appreciate thank your you. input and your time, um, and we'll rendezvous back with you. In the great. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for the direction. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Do, do we need to excuse a certain member of yes. staff? Yes. That's my vote. Yes. Go, Brandon. Second. I, I make a motion. Aye. Brandon, get out of here. Go salvage You've what you can. <laughs> salvage what you can, Mr. Snyder. You've been directed to, to leave. <laughs> we hope you make it on time for your on, Hey, Brandon, on the way back, just practice. Like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Just, like, practice it. Like, <laughs> it needs to be sincere. I'm sorry. Like, can you fake cry? I'm sorry. Fake cry. That sounds like somebody has actually tried that. Dave, we have some parking requirement discussions? Yeah, quick one on parking. I mentioned last month that uh, 
we had an offer on the table. And Someone's going to buy the city. It involves having a planning design studio class. Elon from Musk. BYU. Oh, yeah. Help us uh, analyze our parking requirements and from that uh, kick out a recommendation. So Wonderful. Jackson Dilly and I have a meeting set up for tomorrow to meet with the professor of that class to talk about what that will look like. Um, so sometime between now and midday tomorrow, I've got to get just a white paper, one page put together for things that I want to see happen as a part of that project, which um, in my mind, that's an initial kickoff meeting with at least some of you, which may be outside of a regular planning commission meeting to kind of help finalize the scope for the project. Um, but the scope, in my opinion, would involve a handful of things at least. Um, review of Spanish Forks parking requirements, review of uh, other parking requirements from other like communities in our area, which for me the area is probably Spanish Fork and maybe north, as far north as Ogden along the Wasatch Front. Also, I think a look at parking requirements from other parts of the country for communities in like situation. So we have a few different perspectives to look at and probably some site-specific analysis. Yeah. That would be some evening visits to sites, um, as well as I like that. a review of just contemporary literature on the subject of parking demand and best practices for cities in terms of parking requirements with kind of you know, maybe the capstone part of that being a review of, of parking analyses that have been done for individual developments along the Wasatch Front. These are developer uh, funded, typically, studies that get done. Just again, as another perspective to bring to the table as we look then for that group to, you know, based on uh, all of those different sources, which include, again, some site specific looks at what. Just the reality is, I would say that would pertain to developments in Spanish Fork and probably outside of Spanish Fork. Can, can um, I make a few points before you move on? I forget what I'm thinking because yeah, that happens. Yeah, yeah, so to. I am. Um, what other cities are? Why are we keying off on what other cities are doing? I'm really encouraged by the site specific. Yeah. I think knowing what's going on in some other communities in our own community at certain times, mornings, evenings. Is, is really valuable. I, I don't know if I'm so much concerned about what's working in Payson or, or what Payson's not, no, I am concerned about what's working there, but um, what they're doing or what, you know, Springville or Provo or, or Ogden is, is, is doing. I'd like to know what they found that works and what doesn't. I also think Smashwork has a little bit, I mean, we're not totally unique, but I think we probably have more trucks per capita than most places. Um, yeah, I, and I would suggest that we, we not waste time on, uh, on communities that have large student populations, specifically yep. for Owen Orem. Yep. It's a like waste of time. Communities is really important. Like I mean, you know, yeah, that's a waste of time. Yep. A little different. I completely agree. And, uh, and I also kind of think that the developer's point of view is a little bit of biasing the, the, your, your data information. That's right. So to that point, and to, and to everything I think that you're saying, um, part of the analytical part of this is thinking that through, mm -hmm. right? Okay, so this source might not be uh, a perfect comparison for what we're dealing with here in Spanish Fork, maybe right. because it's coming from a different community, or maybe it's coming from a biased source, you know, as I think we, we're always skeptical when it's a traffic study or anything else, when it's funded by somebody that we know has a specific goal in mind. That's right. So I, mean, I think all of those things, the, that's part of the conversation that I would have with the students. Mm -hmm. you know, like, hey, you know, keep this stuff I could be mind. a great exercise for hey, them, we as long them. as we are filtering it that way. We love students, but they're, not, but, but they're not in our demographic right now, nor will they unless somebody decides to build some kind of... Uh, college or technical school where you'd have something like that 
I mean, it's been, we've had people in front of us already that have said, but we're going to have uh, single people dwelling in this place, you know, two to four at the very most. Well, you know, if there's six kids in an apartment next to BYU, only one of them may have a car. But if they're living in Spanish Fork, they're all going to have a car. Well, we've well, also had it. developers in front of us saying all of our people are going to use transit, so we don't need as much parking. Oh, no. You're going to have to build it first. You know, I mean, if we're going to build some of the stuff that has been proposed around our hub in Spanish Fork, great. We can relook at that particular situation where we're building uh, six or eight story buildings around a hub for, uh, you know, a regional transportation system. But right now I have a number of good friends that drive to Provo to get on Front Runner to work in Salt Lake. But for every one of those, there's a hundred, a hundred that are on the freeway. Oh, no. More than that. More than that. Uh, more than that, probably, I guess. But anyway, I, I would, my only suggestion would be we can't get too awfully interested in other places where, and where transportation is different. The cost of transportation. I went down to Disneyland in November, and I am not kidding you. You know, gas was over five and six dollars a gallon. That changes your, your way of thinking when it comes to transportation. But it doesn't seem to make a difference here. You know? But we have super smart students and somebody who's going, who explains and, you know, our Spanish fort culture, right? And they'll take that into account. I'm, and I, and I, it's I'm a great for, exercise. I, 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 I think it's a, it's, it, I, we're lucky to have that resource. I hope that we can follow through with it. I'm really interested to see what they have to say. Um, and I think we, we just need to make sure we spend the time parsing through the information we get to pull out the nuggets that we need and want to work with. We've had a lot of success mm -hmm. with the same cohort of students. We've also had failures. And uh, when we failed, it's been because we have not set clear expectations mm -hmm. from the beginning. So I worry about this. That's so, right. Uh, I'm confident that this is going to work out well because I think we can do that. So what Todd was saying originally, that's kind of what I was thinking through, which is you mentioned studying regulations from other cities. I think that could work, but the study size, size would have to be way bigger to make that work Got versus it. it's going to be more, I think it'll be more effective to be site specific. But then the next challenge is you want to study sites that everyone agrees there's a consensus that that's a successful parking project. Right. And we may have, that's where we may have run into some issues of, on is, the, is that particular site successfully parked? That's where we're probably run into some differences. But then in addition, one of the reasons why I don't think we should, we should be studying necessarily every other city's regulations is because I suspect these multifamily projects have development agreements that are specific to each one. So even if their re regulations in their zoning is a certain way, it's probably not the way it was applied to this particular project that we like. So we, when we do find the site-specific project, we want to dive into the development agreement. And we want to also find out, I also suspect that a lot of the city requirements, depending on what they are, are being skirted by, a, like, are they actually using the garages for storage? They probably are, even though the city said they couldn't. They probably are. I mean, we want to be aware of what's successful and why is it successful and, and did the city regulation help it be successful? Or I like the idea of not knowing what the failures are and why they were failures. Like that. You yeah. had, you had garages, you study, but it yes. wasn't used. Yes, I agree. So these are the common things. So when we're crafting our regulation, we can know yes. you can put that in there, yeah, but it's, the you're just destined start. to fail with it. Yes, which is why I think when we study the what we all agree are successful projects, I think we're going to find a lot of that. Part of, for me, the project for the students, you know, their professor is an Probably Ridgeline. Um, just <laughs> is to come up with the methodology that they use right. to and the clear expectations. The and the clear expectations are tough. Will, example, they, will they come to us with that, with what methodology? What, I mean, is that part of the step? Is that like we step two, step one? I think, they, I think we kind of give Talk, them like he has to provide all that. The no. scope of what we're trying to, to accomplish here, I think, I mean, for example, we, I also would be trying to provide some guidance and direction, but... So on a couple of, pro I, this is years ago, right? But like when I've had projects like this brought 
that I've been involved with, there's been like an expectation or an objective that was presented by the client, the city or whoever, and then there was a presentation on these are the, this is the methods we're going to use, the means and methods we're going to use to, to examine your request. Exactly. And that was, that was pitched back to the client and they're like, yeah, we like that, let's tweak this, let's modify that. Will they, will they do one. something? I think, that, I think for them, that's a really important thing. Mm -hmm. I, because that, like, it, it, in some sense, and John, I'm sorry. Oh, you're okay. Finish this thought before I totally forget it. Um, I think it's really beneficial for these folks and really necessary for them to look at it like this is a job, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. And I'm, I'm trying to make sure that I understand what the client wants and, you know, therefore I can execute on that. Um, so, for example, just by way of a method, um, uh, it might be like a survey to maybe people that have a, some kind of attached, have a townhome in Spanish Fork to say, how many cars can you park in your garage? How often do you do that? Where do you park your cars? How many cars do you have? You know, doing some things, you know, blind and anonymously so that we can parse some information out just but also I hard data think through what they could do to help get information that's relevant to come up with sound conclusions yeah but also hard data where you're going and counting cars and stalls and stuff during the well, prime, during those I think times that, I think that we definitely cannot lose sight of the fact that we have a problem in Spanish work if you can show me the development that we have too many parking spaces I'd like to see it because our problem with everything that we're seeing everywhere is cars being parked on the road rather than on the property. And you see, and, and, and you always see that as a problem? Yes. Because I'm, I'm thinking of the Salisbury townhomes next to the Fieldstone development I live in. Yes. I and I, I drove that and I drove some others. And I would say that from what I could tell, that seemed like a successful parking scheme. Except if it's the and one And yes, they are parking on the street. Right, right across from the uh, elementary school there. Is that the one you're talking about? No. Which one? Which is no, the, the elementary school. The uh, elementary school Sierra is the one I drove where I do think, I think that's a disaster. Yeah, they're on both sides of the road. Now, which one are you talking about? Uh, Salis oh, Salisbury Legacy Townhomes oh. Legacy, oh, Legacy Farms. Legacy Farms. I, I, I think when I drove thing. that at night, it seemed to be successful. And, uh, and there's some key things that I identified when I drove some that I think made it successful as far as parking, but I, the one across from the elementary school, is this, oh, man, this the one from elementary problem. school. Is this the one? By here and yeah, they park even up to here. Oh yeah. It's a problem. Yeah. And, and you know, is this they don't Maple have Mountain over this way? Yeah. Oh, okay. the, the road width is just nothing. No. I mean, there's a lot of issues with that. Parkview has the same problem. You're driving back through those streets and it's, well, and, and, and it's the same story that we've got. Uh, there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of units in that one that have two cars in the driveway. Uh -huh. and there, but somebody's so, got three or four. So look at this, John. So one of the reasons I think this one's more successful is because uh -huh. the building envelope of each townhome is actually large, which creates more spacing and creates longer roads for the number of units. So therefore, right. there's more parking on the road. There's also a two-car garage and then a very lengthy driveway that actually can accommodate two cars without spilling at all into In, the park strip or the sidewalk. It so just makes it, it oh. makes it feel still open. It's, un, it's pretty unbelievable that it doesn't feel so congested and claustrophobic in, when I drove that. I was actually surprised by it. The direct yeah. result of lessons that we learn from the, from the project yeah. that is south of And then there's Sierra guest Lone. parking, right? No, Same that's not actually. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but they do have guest parking there, which is important. It's also an important part. Of yes, it. it is because that's another problem. If you have so many cars out on the street, it limits what you can do uh, as far as guest parking. One of the things I the think street we parking do wider is your guest parking. Then street parking is an issue because you can't, you know, you're walking two blocks or three blocks to get to whoever you're trying to go visit. What, what do you need for us on this topic? Do you want a list of things? This do you want this discussion? This is my report. Okay. But um, uh, my hope is That's that a, there's an invitation extended. Uh, typically, these folks are available to meet during the day. Oftentimes, commissioners aren't, but usually we can get a couple. So 
So it might be a matter of me just casting a net here sometime next few weeks and saying, hey, a couple of you guys or you might be available to, to sit down with these students to kind of talk through what you'd like to see. And that I've got of, a little yeah, bit of daytime. Yeah, that's part of the part of the kickoff. Um, we have somebody on the inside. Jackson is the TA for this course. So oh, 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 um, nice. Congratulations or condolences, I'm not sure. We'll see. <laughs> it's congr that's a great opportunity for him. No, I think it's a great I think it's a great resource. Great opportunity too. for us. Yeah, I think so too. I'm really excited. Yeah. Um, so that's it on parking. Um, but if any of you guys want to, anything comes to mind that you want me to pass along to those folks. Well, please, later please send out an email. If I'm available, I'd love to attend that. All that up there because that is a good. What is our other business? Planning so Commissioner. For parking. Um, is that a work session, other business? Do we need to, or is that public meeting business? We certainly public meeting it. Okay. Um, simply put, uh, I don't know if any of you have been on the commission. John, Todd, maybe, you might have Sean even. Um, throughout all the, the past few years of my career, we've maintained what I've called a work program for the planning commission which is just a list of topics or a list of projects that you wanted your staff to be working on or that you wanted to have um, placed on your agenda for you to talk about or to work on. I have several in my pipeline at work that are coming through Spanish Fork. Is that what you mean? Like that you can work on no, faster? <laughs> Uh, in the past, it's been things like... Chairman, you got to pipe me. Come on. <laughs> Chairman, be, uh, get serious. Get ready. I'd be very interested in those so we could maybe target right some specific points to be looked very closely at uh -huh. on those. Uh -huh. It's been things like changing the city's landscaping requirements. Mm -hmm. It's been things like changing the city's national plan development program, um, preparing um, recommendations for downtown or changing our design standards for commercial development. Um, things like- Affordable uh, housing. The, the street trees you did. Affordable housing. You I just got your street trees. Any you, of those you did, of you did street trees, trees, yeah. Yeah, and we've, um, at, at different times, it's been really effective. Yeah. And we've done kind of two things. Well, it's been a while since we started from scratch, but basically made a list of things that you guys felt like you wanted to work on maybe over the course of a year. We are new year, and then we take that list and somehow prioritize it. I think it's a good thing to uh, combine that with the city council as well. The city of, does city council I mean, have a list we'll of probably take anything we well, say, or is that yeah general plan? I think we'd all agree general plan, right? That's I think that's already in the works. And general right? plan that certainly I think would be fitting to put on the list. Okay. Correct. Yeah. I think yeah, and. And part of a general plan is affordable housing ideas, but I think it'd be really good for us to be exploring different kinds of affordable housing. What, what do you have in mind when you bring that up? Um, I think I feel like the overwhelming comments we have from the public are, are less of that and more. Correct. That's but we're getting wide. all. But the problem is, no, I, I don't think it's a problem, but we are getting a lot of pressure from the state legislature to make sure that we're considering affordable housing and so we actually approved the here's what we're doing in Spanish Fork to contribute to affordable housing. I think that it would be valuable for us to just explore ideas for it like I feel like what we're I'm comfortable with what we're doing but I but like I went to that conference and went on that tour of the um, affordable housing I can't anyway the development up in Draper area it was just an interesting thing to an, another ideas for our backpack and I think it talking to that particular developer he said this isn't the kind of de development we would do in Spanish Fork but there's another affordable housing type that we would do that we just finished in American Fork and I'm interested in going and looking at that like on a field trip to just hear a presentation from them, like this is one more way, one more avenue possibility for affordable housing. As Sean, and as I, think, Sean and I have talked about that. I don't take what you've told me at least as being this broad subject. It's more a matter of there's this model for affordable housing that 
that Shauna has seen that she thinks worth, is worth exploring for us, that there might be a better way to provide a different kind of housing in Spanish Fork than what anybody's done to date. And you'd like to learn more about that. I'd like to learn right. more about that. So I think for me, that is just schedule some time to learn more about that. Maybe go visit the site, talk to the developer, and that kind of thing. And the model just seems like a sustainable, uh, a, a really, it, it seems like a really good model to me personally. I don't have to push it, but I'd love to explore about it and find out more about it. One of, I, I had one that I've talked about before that's important to me when we're reviewing multifamily housing that we don't have codified yet, which I'd really like us to. One of the goals I'd like to see for Spanish Fork, and I think we actually try to do this, is I want the product type the aesthetics of the products of the townhomes and apartments that we're approving in Spanish Fork to be the most desired multifamily products in the region so that if there, when there is a downturn in the economy, our, cid, our city is still going to be rented out. It'll be the last one to not be rented out because they're the most sought out, highest quality products. And I think we need to put something more robust and defined as, as, as at least as far as aesthetics in elevation requirements, as far as masonry, stack stone, percentages of, of stucco versus non, um, uh, uh, roof pitch. Um, there's a lot of things we can do to make sh to ensure that the product quality is is very high, and we're doing that each time when it's an MPD. But I think if it's in the code, it's going to make it easier for everyone, including the developer. I think there's been an attempt by some of the, well, I think of the development that's been proposed on, uh, on the north end of town. Uh, they haven't been in lately, but you know, they've talked about uh, quite a large development. And, uh, you know, the last time they came in, though, there was a lot of uh, amenities that might jack the price up of that project. So, so one way around that? For the developer, John, in our current code, is to is to just uh, apply for something that's approved by right. Um, if they don't need an MPD, they do not need to do anything we ask them to do as far as aesthetics, unless it's in the code. So that, yeah. I think is this naturally going to come about more when uh, our transportation is built out and we have places that are more. Uh, amenable to having a lot higher density because basically that's how this is going to have to work is that it's going to have to be higher density than just our standard three-story uh, townhome you're you're talking about affordable housing for uh, no I mean, actually well, this no that's not the case quite the case this what was interesting about the field trip that I went on was uh, we, this was either four it was four stories and very much an apartment building interior hallways and this developer said this product would not work in and with the economy the way it's going and or the market the way it's going and the and Spanish Fork community, this wouldn't work here, but we did just build something that's more townhome style, high quality um, in American Fork. I just want to see what they, I mean. Yeah. Well, they, I don't think a developer ever will say low quality. No, I know, but <laughs> that's why I want to. But that's what it's interesting. The but we have, the buildings and right. John, we have macro apartments that we're building, macro, they're apartments. They're 400 square feet, 450 square feet. It's the size of a hotel room. Right. But, it, but it's so micro, yeah, micro, I said micro, micro, micro apartments in there. It's only, it's two stories and then three stories in one area. So it doesn't necessarily need to be a bigger building. Um, it's usually people. just the finishes and the size that are involved in it. So you pencil them out by having a lot less room. You're basically building That's how most of them yeah, a studio apartment, basically. And there's people cases. that are looking, there's people. And, that, and that's places. okay. That product. If that's if, you know, and that's what I that's what I was kind of getting at is, is that we have to 
we have to change the way that we look at the building that is going on now. Right now, we're looking at, at townhomes. Everybody calls them townhomes now, you know, and we've only had one applicant that I can think of that said these are going to be apartments. Well, two now. So, uh, and I appreciate that they're going to do that and make those available. And I think that there's definitely a place for those kinds of developments that you're well, talking about. Doc. I think it needs to be done. It needs to be done right. That's why. Yeah, that's why I do look support at the looking at it. Detail requirements, as far as aesthetics as well. I mean, retail. Detail. Retail. retail. When we have commercial or even office, we these other zones, industrial, we could look at. One thing I want to make sure is when we have some minimum standards. That, is that we're and these are just elevation right tables. It's, it. it's easy on to add. Housing. As long as there's some sort of we're not improving something that will be a, um, a exactly later on I ten years. Is anybody, is anybody concerned about uh, the commercial buildings that are going? In, well, their industrial buildings and just the square boxes that are going up and a glass door into an office that Comina's is doing. Yeah, I mean, so it's going along I-15 from saying right now, design Provo thing. to Payson. Yeah, that's what we're talking about, Eric. Yeah, that's uh, so. That's you know we 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 have we, You're talking about from from Riverside County. To, <laughs> there you to go. Twin Falls. It, you know yes. these these stand up concrete buildings yeah, are great. It's I all mean, over the west. they go up like crazy. But we, when we're talking about three hundred thousand square feet at a time. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying it is what it is, and you're not going to. But, but yeah, you I can guess. make the surrounding look different. I've seen some that's, that through that's their through their site sense. configuration, you can you can soften that a lot. I mean, you can just drive through Salt Lake through our through that industrial area up there and see different. They were built in different times, and be like, okay, landscaping that helps. looks that looks better than what is, you know, a more recent build out of there. But yet, there's got to be. There's got to be room for all kinds of construction. Yeah. And you know. And what about and Dave? Office. What do we? What are? What does this city or staff, this this commission, think about? I mean, how prepared are we for what's going to be coming with our interchange and our uh, front runner station? I mean, that that's something that we should have. I mean, and when we were at our transportation um, that should definitely seminar be that we went on. Yeah, we talked true. then about how we would have one of the ideas we were playing with our little string game was how we'd be mm -hmm. working out, um, you know, a bus rail well, or that something. Definitely is part of the general yeah. plan. Update. This is called a station area plan. Yeah, and but we will probably not get started in 2023, but probably will in 2024 because this by you dot right. We've decided this or by we us. Want to take from the okay. Working with Mag, mm -hmm. Michelle's. We also need the study on the new interchange to be at least far enough along where we know what that will look like mm -hmm. before we think it makes sense to dive into it. And, so, and so doesn't something like that come, to us? become part of a general plan update? I think that's you know, what he told us. The way I would that's look at this, and we're getting a little bit seems a little odd. into just some planning jargon, really, but you've got your overall comprehensive city general plan. Right. Yeah. And go into more detail. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. This would be an area specific plan that wouldn't just say we want this area to be mixed use or we would have these bubble diagrams, but this we might get down to like the local street network design and say, you know, here this is where we want to have five story apartment buildings and this is where we're gonna have an office building. It's just a more specific like the roundabout gotcha. and, and didn't mag tell the roundabout us? overlay area that, on the city that we recently passed that we put roundabouts anywhere we can that's uh, uh, overlay. i received a barcode or a upc thing in the mail so i left comments over on the like spanish fort listening about sense. michael clark and <laughs> roundabouts uh, but yeah no this this yeah. is this is the type of thing so there's it's probably the middle finger emoji there too. <laughs> um, Now that's something that we'd like to take a look at other places 
along the I-15 corridor that have done well. I have an aunt that lives in Salt Lake that moved into one of those high-rise apartment buildings and she just loves it. She's older and doesn't like to drive as much and it's working well for her. Having a nice so walking Cole, area for, as part of that, that stationary has done plan. some around it already and is yes. doing more. All of that um, area is, isn't it? And I'm sure you're, you're in the middle of that a lot, in a lot of cases. Um, some of the lessons learned would probably be really valuable to have there. What about but so a lot of these cool things to, to me, Dave? Oh, sorry. Like a station area and how what we're going to be building around it. TDRs have got to be figured out. We've got it because these are the I these are the receiving that. areas. I have not thought about it, but yeah. Um, just by way of a quick update on that. Um, I think we've been waiting for some direction now for a while, long enough. And for the first time. Or how this group is allocating zone changes that come before us. 100%. And, you know, to throw out a, a, for example, the Modera development that got approved. Yep. Um, you know, that got approved with the highest density that we allowed to date without uh, requiring any TDR purchase. And, and that's consistent with what we've set out from day one to accomplish with the TDRs, where we've said, hey, if you're working within the confines of the existing general plan, you shouldn't have to buy a TDR. densities developing at 30 units to the acre as opposed to maybe 20 units to the acre isn't necessarily as much of a financial windfall for developers as I have thought that it was. Uh, the, the costs that developers incur to construct at those higher densities and to provide parking in ways that work for those higher densities, um, I think there are some underlying premises that we've developed a TDR proposal on that yeah, there's an area where you're saying 20 and then 30s potentially cost prohibitive, but then you have to, you almost have to take a big leap to make it more uh, friendly to the developer. It, it, there's an area in there where it's not as appetizing, and you're right. We're learning more about that all the time. Yes. Yeah. So Dave, uh, TDRs involve water rights as much as anything, right? No, I don't think so. You're, preser you're preserving the, the farm ground, which is oh, important. Oh, okay. And that regard, yeah, I guess. yes, and uh, the farmer is selling his rights to develop the land. That's what that is, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. With the idea that he's keeping the water rights on the land so he can continue to be farmed. Right. And so uh, the only is it being considered? to have other TDR areas other than the river bottoms? Nothing else has been proposed yet. That's what I, that's, that was my question. It could be, right? Well, it could be. It probably but, should use my neighborhood. But I'll until, sell some TDRs. <laughs> yeah, until, until the river bottoms is, you know, until all the TDRs are gone there, I don't know why. I think it's feasible though, there could be other areas. I mean, as the city grows, I, I, I said we're looking at TDRs first time, the extending the river bottoms out to the west into the TDR program one probably of the, makes sense. One of the things that I have seen with landowners 
that are not within the city limits yet is that they're all about preserving the farmland until the developer knocks on the door with a lot of money. And as soon as that happens, uh, you know, uh, many of them are rushing to the bank. So two uh, yards allows them to cash out and still keep their farm away. But that way since the dawn of time. It does, uh, but the developers are offering a lot more money than TDR money. Do we know that? How do you know? How do you if know? If that's that? the case, then it doesn't work. Yeah, right? it doesn't so work that case. The, well, yeah, and, and some of it is being done along the north, you know, with with the uh, developers along uh, the fourth south Springville Road that goes down to Lake Shore. Those people are being offered just grundles of money. I think I'm the confused general, though because the there's not a TDR program to compare against that. Though. Take into account the TDRs. Yeah, most general plans do. Right. Where uh, this is, you know, the, the it's general plan for TDR receiving site densities up to, you know, it actually defines it. We will be hiring a consultant to run the general plan update, and an approach certainly could be, hey, we've been trying to figure out how to keep the river bottoms preserved for, you know, in a focused way for the past four years. This TDR proposal is part of that. Yeah. Figure out how it does or doesn't fit into everything else we're trying to do. The general plan. And the general plan. Wonderful. Yeah. But in, and that's just my thought. And like that's the nexus, or that's not the nexus, but the impetus for the conversation on tomorrow. Yeah. With my boss. And see where that goes. Now, we don't need to spend all night talking about this. But what I'd like to do is type this up. Email you guys. Good idea. Uh, you know, the idea is that this certainly is fluid. I'm just putting these down as the potential list of priorities. That does help us as staff. It's a good story. One thing that doesn't work for us is to not focus on one thing from start to finish. Right? You just leave. And it. that's not to say that we can't have multiple things going on at the same time, but having some focus so that we're seeing things to a finish line yeah. makes it so that things get done. Otherwise, in my experience, they don't. So I think, so for me personally, the affordable housing, to me, that just seems like kind of something it's, Easy. it well, yeah, there's the one project we can do, but I think that it's important for us to keep exploring, like continually say, okay, what's the next affordable housing, great affordable housing ideas that we are, um, that that might be a, poss a, a possibility that works in Spanish for. Does that make sense? It does. Like it's an investigation of putting tools in our backpack. This is why I really like where Sean is. Because I think trying to get the conversation to go with that. I don't know what the exact number ended up being, but you know that uh, cities have been required for the past several years to submit affordable housing plans to a state agency that reviews them and either approves them or rejects them. Um, uh, the number was north of 80% of communities in Utah, 80% of communities in Utah that submitted their plans this year had their plans rejected. Did every city submit? I'm sure there were some that didn't, but that was there weren't very many. And what's the penalty if it's rejected? Uh, potentially you lose B and C road funds and different things like that. So as of two years ago, there now is a real penalty for not having a, excuse me, an affordable housing, it's actually a moderate income housing plan. Um, How do they define that? So it's actually the State Department of Workforce Services, they review it and they have created their own analysis and they simply determine whether or not you have met the criteria. And it was a bit of a brouhaha in November, when cities first started to get their notices, that the plans that they had submitted did not qualify. Did you tell uh, them that did for we the qualify? constitution, the city's in charge of zoning, so they can go take a hike? No. We you didn't tell them that? Because the state legislature wants to change that. <laughs> so yeah, our representative, well, well, and our representative, Stephen White, is like one of the yes. heads of that committee. Which the is amazing. State legislature. 
freshman that is representative to have that position. But I think he has some background in that as well. Yeah, I, I wondered, and he must. I looked up something about that. But, anyway, um, anyway. Um, the belief is that what cities have done in the past probably is not going to cut it going forward. And to answer your question, Shauna, um, you might remember that you we, that to Stephen White. we needed to have Stephen White. Um, oh, I would be happy to. In fact, they're already meddling, which is a, which is contrary to their actual state constitution. As part of our plan, already we need, what we they're doing. Five yeah, we submitted them. Three different strategies that are options for cities to choose from, as part of our plan um, that we submitted to the state, um, and uh, same for every city. We submitted with nine different strategies. We actually added a few after meeting with you and the city council about like we started with seven they rejected two of ours and the two that they rejected i thought are just ridiculous that they rejected them um but because we had nine ended up with seven we've got a plan that is compliant now but um we will have to retool and look for different ways to to keep satisfying those requirements so that's why it's so I, I want to ask these two guys that are involved in this kind of uh, projects in one way, shape, or form. Uh, when there is a an affordable housing project that's done, uh, what contractors or developers, I should say, what developers are involved in these? Is it uh, do they do they need to just build? a large number of them to pencil out or are there programs that uh, so that's where we need to have the presentation from that, this guy he totally explained all that well see I mean yeah. somebody's got to there pay are. for this yes and of course when it's somebody it's me well no no there's both private funding like the one that I went was partly fun like there was there is government funding so yeah we're paying for that and there was private funding in this case, the one I went to was like American Express, and it was like for a certain amount of time, and the financing. Anyway, he explained this financing, and it's a really interesting concept. That's why I want them to come well, and tell everything us. Everything we've ever done. Is, is why aren't we building them all over? If, if, they're, if they're affordable, and if they are uh, money makers for the developer, well, why aren't Because, well, because this developer in this getting them one, approved are a beast. And, and, and you get like a hundred people coming out against you every single time. It is a beast to get anything like that. Well, and most of them are HUD development money. So yeah, and, the, the and qualifying for HUD money. The hoops you have to go through. Yeah. Yeah. Is like, a nightmare. It's nice to see, hear someone tell you about qualifying for HUD, but actually qualifying for HUD is another story. Yeah. And then the public opinion on them, I mean, it's great when they're brand new, 20 years down the road. Yeah. Well, that's yeah anyway yeah uh, I get I guess I'm always I'm always a little bit skeptical of the phrase I'm from the government and I'm here to help you what but you are from the government John I am the government and you are helping us anyway I think it's worth giving a chance to at least hear I think it's good to hear it yeah and so we, we can be educated to, on it exactly we don't have to embrace it but we need to start hearing about but, and understanding I, anytime anytime I hear a developer open their mouth I just assume they're not telling the truth. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's it's one of those things, man. I'm, I what if the developer is also a lawyer? Then they're more likely oh, to be <laughs> uh, Then they're man. then they're bound. Yeah. Then what? they're they're bound by their whatever. I don't know. <laughs> I try to walk into one for Todd. I have to try to make it easy. How about a developer attorney? Ooh. Some guy that's left school goes Pretty surfing most of the time. Apparently. Okay, Dave, do you have anything else? Because I'm about to move to close the meeting. Yeah. I'm just going to throw that out as a starting great. point. Be massaged, whatever. And uh, we will, though. We will try to touch base on these things as is appropriate. Thanks. I that's think it. they're really important to pursue. And one of the most important is the affordable housing. And I just don't know. It just seems like an elephant that we've got to eat. A, step, a bite at a time. And it's yes, time to I'm start taking bites. It's time. 
That also yeah. certainly is a big part of the general plan update, right? Yep. Housing yes. and providing housing hey, that is a, yeah. I'm sure, a central topic of discussion. And the win is we submitted nine and got seven accepted, right? It That's was a so win. Good to email my colleagues. Yeah. Like, uh -huh. <laughs> you all owe me pizza. Okay, I move that we adjourn the meeting. Second. Second. <laughs> all in favor? Aye. 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 Hey, we are adjourned. <laughs> we are adjourned.